And okay, so uh, good morning. It is Wednesday, April 28th. It's 8.34 a.m. This is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy. Um, we are in our final week of um, formal testimony. Uh, we may have some special meetings called after this Friday, but um, this week we're actually doing oversight and revisiting a number of issues, all with an eye towards um, both keeping the committee informed and thinking about work we may uh, do over the summer and fall to prepare for next session. Uh, one of the areas of concern and interest of the committee is forestry. And um, we visited with uh, Commissioner Snyder recently, who gave us the sobering news that we're losing roughly 11,000 acres of forest land every year. Um, we talked about talked with the commissioner about uh, plans for how, uh, some ideas for how we might be turning that around. But uh, we also wanted to reach out to others in the uh, forest and forestry community and uh, hear from them as well as part of uh, thinking and preparing for next session. So with that, um, we have two hours blocked out this morning. And our first guest is uh, uh, Jamie Fidel from the Vermont Natural Resources uh, Council. So um, Mr. Fidel, good morning. Thank you for coming back. It's good to have you in with us again. And I'd like to turn the floor over to you to um, hear your thoughts this morning. Well, thank you. Good morning. Good to see you all. I appreciate the invitation to, uh, to talk with you today. It's been uh, interesting to, to track some of your conversations and appreciate your continued attention to the role that forests play uh, to our forest, uh, to our overall economy and our ecological health and well-being. Um, so I thought I'd share my screen and, and share some, some information and some policy recommendations with you. I'm gonna go fairly quickly through it because I'll share the presentation with you and I've sent you, your committee, some background reports that we've worked on. So um, you have some relevant uh, material to, to work with. Okay, is this coming through okay for you? Uh, yes. yes. Thank you. Okay, great. So I'm gonna really focus on just the overall theme of, of uh, maintaining sustainable forests, maintaining forest as forest in Vermont, which is so much of the underpinning of uh, how do we promote um, um, you know, forestry opportunities in Vermont and uh, land management, land conservation opportunities. Um, so just a couple slides of, I think why we all love living here um, you know, our, our rural landscapes, um, also dependent on, you know, vital, um, downtowns and villages surrounded by rural countryside, um, our farms and our working forests, um, you know, our wildlands and, um, our watersheds, <clears throat> the wildlife that we have in the state, both aquatic terrestrial um, hunting, fishing opportunities, outdoor recreation, places just to be with our, our families and, um, and, the, and the forest landowners, the landowners in Vermont that are so important to the health and well-being of our forest being that our forests are overwhelmingly uh, owned by private landowners versus being in, in pub public land management. Uh, this is not new to you. Commissioner Snyder um, gave you the important overview, the statistic that we are we are losing um, 11,000 acres roughly a year of net forest. And I just wanted to, to highlight that we're actually losing more than that every year. And this is according to the Forest Service uh, data um, and that we've been experiencing this um, in the last decade or so, you know, we're losing forest versus this incredible success story that we've had over a century of regrowing our forest from heavy land clearing. So we're actually on average uh, estimated to have to be losing like over 14,000 acres to conversion from development and other activity. And then there's, there's some forests that are reverting back, um, non-forest moving into forest cover. And that's how we then get to a net loss of 11,000 acres. Um, but anyway, I think uh, hopefully we're all in agreement that this is not a trend that's, that's helpful for us in the state. And the pattern of how this development occurs is really important. 
Um, I thought it was really interesting. I've been doing some work re recently to, to, you know, think about climate policies as there's work going on in the state. Not the first climate commission that's doing work. Governor Douglas had a climate commission and one of the highest rated priorities recommendations there was to keep forests as forest and reduce the rate of forest land conversion. Since that report came out in 2007, forest cover in the state has decreased by 6%. And so we are losing forest and we're losing them at a concerning pace. Um, so in order to minimize that loss and the fragmentation that comes with, with, with as forests are being converted and developed, we do need to understand sort of the precursor and that's, you know, what's going on with land sales, what's going on with an increasing division of land, subdivision, the parcelization of our, of our land and our forest. I think this is really telling. Um, um, we, I think we've always been under the assumption that something could dramatically change that would increase the influx of, of out-of-state landowners and, and pressure on our land. We saw this last year with COVID migration. It's fair, I think, for us to think that with a changing climate, uh, this may happen as well, and other uncertainties um, out there. And so this is uh, data that VCGI put together based on tax department transfer, you know, sales, and it just is very telling. Maybe you all saw the article about this in, in Vermont Digger, you know, 38% increase in overall residential property sales to out-of-state buyers in 2020. And it's really interesting to look at where this is happening. Um, and a lot of our, you know, Chittenden County, but then all in a resort communities, um, and it's really incredible if you look at the numbers here of both, um, well, you can see geographically where it's happening, um, Southern Vermont in particular, which is no surprise as far as the easy access to our sort of metropolitan areas, um, but also the value, the value of land and how much it increased, you know? And so for example, um, um, and just as a baseline, that 38% increase in property sales last year you know, the years before that, the average was 3%. And so that just gives you some context of how high it spiked. Um, you know, in addition to the value of real estate sold to out-of-state residents, um, so as far as land value goes, that increased by 79%. And, and raw land sales track this. So we actually were provided some information from from. Um, real estate companies that actually work with, with raw land. And in one instance, company aggregated the data and there was an 87% increase in the sale price of raw land. So it's, it's not just that, you know, sales or residences that are built, houses that are built are, are being bought. Um, it's land is being bought as well. And the price of that land has gone up astronomically. So that puts a lot of pressure on then, you know, potentially the development subdivision of land. So the parcelization is simply the breaking up of land into smaller and smaller parcels. Um, we've, I think you, you all are well aware of, of kind of the implications of this. And again, this is not to say that we, sh we shouldn't have growth in the state. We are going to have growth. We want to have growth. Just how do we do it? How do we do it in a smart way so that we're still maintaining the rural land base that's so important to our state and having some functions still existing as the development plays out. We have viable forestry and we have, um, we have healthy ecosystems. Uh, we've been at this for a while as far as an organization. Vermont Natural Resources Council uh, in 2006 convened a forest roundtable. Um, we've been meeting consistently every year, exception of this last year due to COVID. Um, and we specifically have been tackling this issue of, of how to keep forests as forests and address fragmentation. And there's now um, well over 200 people tracking the progress of, of the conversations. But we did put out a, a report, uh, a final report in 2007. I did provide that to your committee because there's a lot of recommendations in there that still deserve attention. Um, you know, there's over 100 people that came together to provide these recommendations. It was a very diverse group. So you're not just getting a window into what does the conservation community think? What does the forestry community think? What does the forest products industry think? State and federal agencies, you got the benefit of all of them, plus a lot, many, many others, um, including professional planners and rural development folks, uh, to really focus on um, kind of a document with a consensus set of recommendations. And there's, there's, you know, they're, they're, they're in buckets. And as Commissioner Snyder presented to you, and I don't think this is a mystery, that there are sort of this consolidation of, of themes or buckets of work to do. And that's, you know, how are we addressing tax policy and the carrying cost of land? 
How are we addressing land use planning and conservation planning in the state? How do we value ecosystem services, the services that landowners provide and make it economically viable for landowners to continue to main, maintain those services? How do we maintain a long-term sustainable forest products industry, which I believe is part of what you'll be approaching this morning. And all of these strategies are vitally important. It's not like we should be just focusing on one of these buckets. In order to reverse the trends that we're seeing, we really do need to look at kind of a diversified portfolio of strategies that cover all of these buckets and more. <clears throat> um, you can read the report, you know, they're organized into different sections. This was just to give you an example, you know, of some of the recommendations. I also gave you a checklist, which just pulls out the recommendations so you can easily see uh, the checklist. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But, you know, part of the effort was to basically say, we really need to get a handle on what is happening in the state. What are the trends? Um, how much are we parcelizing our landscape? How do we integrate that into planning and, and land use planning and correct gaps? And I'm happy to report, and Commissioner Snyder did, I think, an excellent job highlighting in his report to you recently, the progress that's being made on many fronts. And then I think we're all recognizing there's, we still have gaps, even in light of the attention of so many different people and agencies and stakeholders and organizations in the state to to make progress. So we, we, are, we are doing a better job of understanding where these intact forest blocks represented in green are located, uh, mapping where the infrastructure, the roads and the houses are in red so that we do see spatially the fragmentation that is happening in our state and where there are still many opportunities. Uh, Senator Campion, you have a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Good to see you, Mr. Fidel. Thanks for being here. <clears throat> One of the things that will be interesting as you're going through this, and I, I, it looked like you were getting to some recommendations, you know, a few pages prior, actually, uh, is how your recommendations differ from uh, the commissioners. In other words, you know, what are the things that um, you might be putting forward that either the commissioner or the agency isn't adopting? And that kind of side by side, I think, would, would help us uh, to understand, you know, I'll, you know, everybody might be, you know, perfectly in line. But if not, that that information would be very helpful to us. Thank you. And um, well, so, uh, Mr. Fidel, do you want to respond to that? Uh, I also see Senator McCormick has his hand up. I think as I get into some later slides showing actual recommendations, I could I could highlight. Um, you know, how to address that, that request. Yeah, no, I would appreciate that. I think it would inform our policy. I mean, again, <clears throat> your numbers are even higher than the ones that we've heard. And um, something, again, might not be happening that needs to happen. So with that, uh, I can let Senator McCormick now to the floor. Thank you. Uh, I'm it feels funny calling you by your first name, but Jamie, we've been friends for a long time. Uh, you use the term, you refer to, to so many acres of forest land being lost. What exactly do you mean by lost? Does that mean heavily logged or actually built on or uh, subdivided? What does lost mean? Yeah. Oh, great question. It actually means converted to non-forest use. And so the Forest Service actually tracks the lands that are being managed, harvested. And so if there's a clear cut for forestry purposes, um, that's not included. I think what they're tracking is outright conversion to non-forest use. And so they're tracked in different ways. So you could look at the amount of land that's being managed, which then, you know, will will go through a regrowth versus those lands that have been converted and not and are not expected to remain, you know, forest into the future. Well, um, not expected to remain forest or not expected to be logged. Well, they've they're non they're, they're they're they've been converted to more of a development status, and okay. so they're not you know man they're not managed forests where they've been logged or harvested, and then there's going to be you know regrowth over time or you know uh, improved forest growth because of the, the harvesting activity. This is a different category. This is what a, what's been converted, yeah. what's been lost. There are there are some people who are prosperous enough they can afford to own acreage that they don't uh, har harvest and they just wanna own beautiful forests and then they, the, the nicest of them let their neighbors use it for free. 
does that count as, as, as having lost that forest? No, I mean, I think they're looking at the, the acres that's actually been converted. And I'm actually going to get to that, that, what you're talking about in a minute with a different metric that we've been, we've been tracking. That, okay. That's some data, what you're asking for. Thank Thanks. You. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Senator Westman. So, um, make sure. So, Jamie, um, the, um, I get the loss of forest in going to development, but the breakup of tracks from big, um, big sections of land to much smaller sections of land, you know, um, uh, a 200 acre piece that becomes a 30 acre piece. Um, are you tracking that? Because um, that becomes much um, those lots become much harder to deal with um, for conservation, for production, for any number of reasons when that happens. Yes, totally agree. And I'm going to show you the tool that we created to actually track and show that that information. Um, then I'll shut my mouth. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm actually just about to get there. I think you're all familiar with, again, you know, just acknowledging the efforts that you, your committee in particular, have helped to lead on, you know, passing Act 171, which is a forest omnibus bill, which had a lot of different mechanisms in it, um, including, you know, new planning uh, at the municipal level to identify important forest blocks and habitat connectors and uh, to plan at the local and regional level to minimize the fragmentation of those areas. I'll talk a little bit later about why this is so important. Um, but just acknowledging this. And then the guidance document that was developed for communities to, to implement that. And we've been tracking the status of how this is being implemented over the last two years. And I'll, I'll in the conclusions, talk about how that could be relevant to your continuing work. Okay, uh, Senator Westman, um, to get to your um, issue. Oh, Senator, I, I, oh wow. <laughs> Yeah, so we've actually been doing, and this all came out of the Forest Roundtable. I pretty much used the Forest Roundtable report as a blueprint for my work and what I try to, to work on and secure grants to do with, with, you know, in partnership with many folks. And so we actually have three different individual reports that we've done um, that's available on our on a parcelization website page, um, which I'll show, show you in a second. Uh, three different, you know, iterations of trying to track this. We've created the statewide database to look at parcelization or subdivision trends. Um, the first one was developed with Deb Brighton, and then a more recent one with a researcher, Brian Voigt. Um, and now we're looking at actually replicating that again, and I'll show you why that's so important. So this goes, this whole effort started in 2003 and goes to 2016. Um, you know, when one of the phases, phase two, we actually looked at um, subdivisions in 22 case study towns. So the database we developed is based on the grand list. It's available for property tax purposes, but you could take information out because land is classified in different categories. And we can look at the trends in those, those categories. We also as another exercise, actually went to the town level and combed through subdivision records of 22 towns just to see what was happening because it's, it's harder to understand what's happening at the parcel level. Um, through the grand list data. And so this is just some statistics for you to see. You know, we looked at how many lots were being created and the size, you know, just in 2002 to 2000, 2002 to 2009, there were, you know, almost 2,750 lots created from 925 subdivisions in 22 towns. So this is just to say that while we have an understanding in Vermont that we don't have heavy population growth or much population growth at all, that doesn't mean that we're not subdividing our land and accommodating second homes or, or new homes. They're, they're different metrics to track. Um, on average, each subdivision resulted in two to four lots. This is why it's rel relevant to your work as you look at you know, potentially updates to Act 250 because the majority of subdivisions are not triggering Act 250. That's just because simply they're small. They're only two to four lots. They're not triggering the threshold in Act 250. Uh, Senator Campion. So you may have, <clears throat> mentioned this, uh, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but one of the things that uh, I think you're getting at, and I raised, I think with the commissioner or at some point is, have you identified those towns that are at greatest threat <clears throat> at this point? In other words, you know, one of my, you know, you look at this area, <clears throat> you look at commuting distance to Albany, New York, you look at towns that don't have zoning, <clears throat> you don't, you know, and 
as I look at other things the legislature has done, even this committee, around you know setting up plans for management, uh, you know, can we and should we be doing that? So, do we know those towns that are most possibly under threat at this point? Yes. So there's two things that will help with that. And one recommendation I was going to make at the end was for you to um, potentially invite me back to report on the 10. We, we do every 10 years in partnership with the Agency of Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife Department, an assessment of local regulations and how they're treating forest and wildlife resources. And through that, what, what we, we know uh, how many subdivision regulations, where, where are the towns with zoning or without zoning? It's a database. Where are towns with subdivision regulations? Where are the towns that don't have it? And then I'm going to show you in a second this parcelization tool that we developed where you could actually spatially look at the hotspots. Where is there a lot of parcelization and subdivision happening? And so I think there's ways to combine this um, to start to really understand sort of like early detection, if you will, like where, where are areas most threatened? So, and then, and then I think for us, I mean, it's always great to have this information, but then what's happening at the agency level or what do we need to do to make sure the agency is moving on this stuff if, if they're not moving on it. So yeah. thank you. I'll get to some of those recommendations. I'm going to quickly go through this because uh, this would maybe be a whole other, you know, presentation to you all. It's just that we look at where the development's taking place. It's mo a lot of it's in our rural residential districts, not our conservation related districts. And so if we don't pay attention to the patterns within these default districts that are like rural residential districts, uh, if we don't address fragmentation in those areas, then that we're going to just con continue to see that that overall fragmentation pattern. And so to get to Senator Campion's point, trying to improve our land use planning approaches and strategies um, is a lot of the work that we've been doing where there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, we've done spatial mapping to show that these subdivisions are, are happening in our uh, intact map forest blocks. So sort of say like, this is happening. I don't think it's a real debate that we're developing in our forest blocks and that we have subdivisions happening. How we track it, how we understand it, get to the early warning kind of system is all, all the kind of work we're doing in partnership with, with many, including uh, state agencies. I'm just gonna go through this very quickly because it gets to more of your questions. So then we did a, a new round lately. Came, the data came out in 2016 about the trends in parcels it's based on the grand list and current use data number of metrics that you can explore on our website, huge steering committee of partners so that, you know, there was a major integrity in this approach. Um, and this private land trends, you know, so roughly 70% of the land in Vermont is based, is represented in parcels 50 acres or larger, which was good. That was just like an arbitrary cutoff we had to say what's a large parcel, um, but, as you get into the categories then of how land is classified and in, in according to grand list, it could be residential. We looked at woodland, which is undeveloped forest land. We looked at farm. We looked at other category, which is a catch all for a number of other like utilities and different categories. And so the take home message here though, is even though 70% of our land is in parcels 50 acres or larger, 40% of that is cat categorized as residential, meaning there's a house associated with that land. Senator McCormick's point, that doesn't mean the forest is lost, it's there, it just means there's a house with infrastructure. And as those houses continue to be put on a landscape, then there's impacts, fragmenting impacts. Again, the pattern matters. It's not that we're saying, don't have this development, we're gonna develop in forest, but how we do it's really important. The woodland category, undeveloped forest is where we've seen um, the most striking Senator, loss. Senator, um, Senator Westman? So can you back up to sure. that? So my question is, if I build a house and it's in a development and it has a roof and it has a small driveway onto a road and I'm hooked up to a septic line, um, the impact of that I think is less than if I have a 40 acre lot and then I do a driveway, but my driveway ends up being a a um, hundred yards and uh, is there any way that we have um, tried to measure the difference of the impact between something that is more um, suburban or tighter packed than something that would be the breakup that you're talking about here? Because every time you do a subdivision, whether it's 
50 acres from 200 or it's um, in a village less than that, there's an impact. So I'm trying to measure the impact. Yeah. No, this is great. I'm going to invite you to join a working group that we have uh, on this very topic because this is what we're trying to actually measure. So to cut to the chase, we've created a database in the state that allows you to aggregate subdivision information. What we can't do is track it at the parcel level because the state has digitized parcel maps and because the state now has LIDAR mapping where we're creating a tool um, to actually measure forest fragmentation over time. The holy grail here is to link that information. And we just put in a proposal, um, which we're keeping fingers crossed could be, could be funded to actually begin the work of then linking all of that together. So we're measuring where the subdivision is happening and what is the resulting fragmentation of loss from that parcel level development that's happening. Right now, we only kind of aggregate it at the the town, the county, the regional level, the statewide level. But there's a huge effort to do exactly what you're asking for. We just haven't connected all the technology to do that just yet, but we're right on the verge of being able to do it, I think. Um, but I will yeah. give you some more helpful info that, that covers that a bit. Um, okay. Because we, we are looking at where the, oh, I'm sorry, did you have another question? Yeah, it, it just seems to me that if I'm in the middle of the woods and I cut out a place to have a lawn and I, uh, I've, create created more surface area for runoff i've um cut trees that um that are um dealing with carbon if i and if i'm in a compact area so i think that's really important for us to be able to measure the impacts of this spread out over the countryside versus um, um compact development yeah I totally agree with you as far as the concept you're raising and the premise that that there's patterns that matter and 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 how how development happens can have a much greater impact on the issues you're talking about and um, yes it's what so much of our work technical assistance with communities is trying to help with those those uh, those techniques that minimize those impacts while still accommodating development um, so we are tracking um, where. So this just shows the parcelization trends, right? We're increasing smaller and smaller parcels and reducing larger parcels. And our, our larger parcels, 50 acres or larger are on the decline. And this was the big take home message um, that uh, I'm not sure if your Zoom screens may be covering this, but this is the take home message here that if, when you aggregate and look at this data as a whole, it's the woodland parcels, undeveloped forest land that, that decreased the most out of a category. Um, now, some of this land did transfer into public ownership. So it's not that 15% of land is no longer forest. It's that 15% of land is no longer classified as undeveloped forest. We estimate maybe 3% of that went into public ownership, which is great trend. But then maybe the resulting 12% was actually no longer undeveloped forest. And now is infrastructure, roads, um, house, houses on it. And the residential increase by, by um, went up the uptick as well. So this is just showing the overall classification changes. Um, this is just another visual to, to look at this. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're showing where those, where those dwellings are happening. And so we do know where new homes are being built. So we could develop that tool to get to Senator Westman's point of then, if we know where the, the new, where, where parcels are having new homes, how do we actually look at the spatial impact of that development as it's happening? over time and measure that. And that's very much where we'd like to go with a lot of this work. Um, but this just shows how many parcels are creating new residences. Again, sort of just to buck that narrative that we don't have population growth versus development on the ground are two different metrics. Um, we also looked at UVA. I know a lot of your conversations talk about kind of where a lot of the growth is happening and that, you know, 25 acre parcel, I think Senator Westman, you've talked about this, you're right. This is, you know, we've quantified that this is where growth is happening in the program. Um, you know, so our larger parcels are not necessarily where we're growing the program. It's be through subdivision and parcelization. We're creating more of these, these parcels that can to meet that 25 to 50 acre category. So that puts pressure on the program from an administration perspective um, and a host of other issues. So we're helping to quantify that. We also quantified though the, the benefit of the program, how important the program is in maintaining undeveloped forest land. It does work. We've quantified that 
If you're enrolled in current use, the trend is that land is going to stay undeveloped as forest land at a higher rate than lands that are not enrolled. So this is the parcelization website. If you're really interested in this, I'd be glad to give you a one-on-one -on -one, you know, tutorial of this or come back to your committee sometime because there's a lot of data to explore in here and a lot of different tools in order to look at your town or your county or a region and look at the trends to get at sort of what Senator Campion was at. Was I wanna know where, where the hot area is. This website will show you. Um, so now getting to the recommendations because I I'm, I'm realized that I'm already past, I think, my time. So I just, there's a couple of uh, things I just wanted to let you all know. There's been so much work in the state to develop policy recommendations. I don't think we're at the point where, where we need to step back and say, well, what are the policy recommendations? The Forest Roundtable has been doing it since 2007. You have the report. We actually then did a full-blown forest fragmentation action plan, actually work with the land use planning community across the board at all different levels and state agencies to basically say, what's the land use planning action plan? And so this, this plan is available, I sent it to you. It's got a whole number of recommendations in there and who, who could carry out the tasks. It gets at a lot of the issues you've been talking about, very specific recommendations. We don't have time to go into them today, um, but there's actually one even related to legislative changes at the state level. So I encourage you to read that. Uh, there's all the reports that Commissioner Snyder has been talking about, um, you know, including kind of the seminal 2015 fragmentation report this forest health and integrity report that he presented to you and, and you know, the really comprehensive report that he just provided to your committee on, on the progress that's being made um, and where there are outstanding gaps. Um, I really do appreciate the time that must've gone into to giving you that report. I do think it's really relevant. And to get to your point, Senator Campion, about wh where's our overlap, where are their differences? Um, I guess I would say that, well, just to round out, there's, there's so many other reports. You know, there's this report that was done for the legislature on how do we improve successional planning. There's a lot of really good uh, recommendations in that report as well. So we have all these combined in our parcelization website as a go-to place to read all these reports or your, your website may now have it. So there's no dearth of, of recommendations and policy steps to act on. Okay, so how do we then understand, you know, how do these overlap? There's a lot of overlap between these reports um, because I think a lot of the conversations have happened with stakeholders that are interested. There are some differences. Um, so I would suggest one thing is, I provided this checklist to you from the 2007 Forest Roundtable report. This includes the work of over hundred people. We could, for example, continue to operate as a round table this summer. And if you are interested, come back to you early next year with a report, just like Commissioner Snyder did on what's the progress on all these recommendations? What are the boxes we've checked? Where's there additional work to be done? So that's just one idea. I didn't have time to do that for all of these recommendations. And quite honestly, we'd rather do it with the round table than just as an individual trying to assess how far we've come and where are their gaps. So that's one idea, whole set of recommendations here. Um, You've got the recommendations from Commissioner Snyder's reports. You have the forest land use planning action plan I gave you. And so trying to understand the side-by-sides could be a next step as well. I've just pulled out some strategies here that we've been paying attention to. Some of these may be, may be uh, overlap with what Commissioner Snyder presented. Some may present some, some new, new ideas here. You know, I think what I, what I was struck by Commissioner Snyder's report was he was saying there are these buckets, just like what we've been saying through our work with the round table. And it's important, there's no silver bullet here to get us out of this trend. We've got to really diversify, we've got to be hitting it. He was really talking about the strength of maintaining our, our rural working forest economy, which, which we agree with and which we've talked about in our recommendations too. I'd say where there's maybe a little bit of difference is just because VNRC is so much of a land use um, oriented organization that we're looking at all these trends and we're, we're refining, I would say, more policies that relate to land use planning and offering more in that bucket. While we're still trying to highlight the importance of addressing tax policy, land conservation, ecosystem services, working forest, all of those. And so these are just recommendations for you to consider here. I don't really know if I have time to, uh, to read them, if that would be helpful, or if you just wanna have this presentation to kinda, to kinda sit with, I think, you know, at the highest level. Um, right. For, well, you know, unfortunately, we're a little, 
yeah. over. And there's, uh, I mean, this is, a, you've brought a set of really rich resources to us this morning. So even though we're uh, winding down the session, I think um, my sense is we'll want to schedule more time for more conversation before we actually adjourn. Um, so that we can organize to make progress on this uh, over the summer and fall to be ready uh, for uh, next, to be better prepared for next session. Uh, Senator Campion. Yeah, I mean, I'm at more of the, what are, what would you recommend from, from your perspective are the things that we hit the ground running on? I mean, like you said, we've heard it all, you know, we've, we've got the ideas, we've got um, things from the commissioner, now things from you. I don't think the committee needs anything else, but really uh, these are the top things that would really help us to pause what is a, a, what is a big crisis in this state. And uh, so, I mean, that's what I've been, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, I, we could, yeah, we can have you back in to talk more, but I'd like to know, bam, what are the things that we should be drafting to get ready for January, including you know, I appreciate all the maps and everything, but again, it's uh, like you said, we've got all the information. Now, what do we do? And I think we've got to start to say, to recognize that if we don't really allow towns to somehow do better zoning, get them the dollars to, to help, help them to understand what their town may look like in 10 years, if they don't do certain things, all those kinds of things, I think have gotta be on the table and including the state purchasing land sometimes and send it, setting it aside and creating lands that are managed uh, by the state. So um, past decade, you know, we're getting worse and worse. And, um, and that of course, I think worries everybody here greatly. Okay, uh, Senator Westman. I um, agree with Senator Campion and I think we have a general, but I would say that I think we sometimes all get um, tied down in the weeds on this. And I would say um, your reports are great, Jamie, but for the person on the street, why is this, why should we all as a population be concerned about this? For me, it comes down to if I've done a, um, a big lawn in a long driveway on, um, an, uh, in a, what was a wooded spot, I'm contributing to carbon more than I would. I am contributing to runoff in a way more than I would. I am um, on that lot. I am um, making it harder for the people that made um, um, their living offering traditional things like forestry, harder to manage the land. But we need to tell it in a bullet story that, um, that the public gets. That will set the groundwork to be able to do work in this area. If um, you know, a lot of this stuff is, it's really important information, but it isn't in a form that, um, that the guy or the person um, on the street understands. Yeah, it's a really good point. We've created some landowner guides that try to, to do that and offer the strategies, um, all the education outreach that needs to happen. And I, was, I wanted to leave you with a couple ideas here, and, and one of them could be incorporated in what you were just saying, Senator Westman. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt, like I'm a policy wonk and I, I get into the weeds on the data and whatnot. So if that's helpful to you, I mean- two, Love two the I weeds. <laughs> <laughs> I love the weeds, but- Two ideas to, to, to hang out in the weeds and then to move us at the higher level would be, um, if you're interested, I could come back at the beginning of next year and actually, so one priority for us is to update all that parcelization and subdivision data through 2020 and we're exploring how to actually get it to the parcel level. I could come back and report on the trends of where we are now up to current time, basically. And we could look at what happened during COVID migration because we have the data on the sales of land, but we don't have the data on resulting subdivision and parcelization. And that's what we're gonna work on over the summer. 
I can also report back to you on this whole 10 year review we've been doing, which will show you the success and the gaps of the Act 171 planning um, to reduce the rate of fragmentation and all kinds of other statewide you know, trend data. That could give you a baseline of understanding of better of where we're at right now at this time. And then you know, a final idea, the forest round table is well suited to pick up if you were to ask the round table to, to at a higher level, start doing these side-by-side -side comparisons of all these policies and start to pulling out the highest level priorities to help us focus what would be the priorities from this group of stakeholders to you and to, to put it into very easy bullets like Senator Westman was just saying and to talk about the status like Commissioner Snyder did of the status of those recommendations. I think this round, the roundtable group is well suited to sort of respond to that re kind of request. Um, and um, so I would, I would, you know, consider that, see how you can utilize our, our group with the number of stakeholders that, that meet. Um, hey, so um, <laughs> Mr. Chair, <laughs> we're, we're in that I'm difficult ahead. place. So Senator McCormick, then Senator McDonald, then Senator Campion, we have three. And then, then I think we, we do need to move on because we have another uh, rich presentation and three more witnesses. Well, we don't know if they're, those presentations are as rich as this one, so. Uh, Stay tuned. Um, Senator McCormick, I'm, we can't hear you, you yet. I, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm so glad that Senator Westman likes it in the weeds. Uh, us big picture guys need people like him to <laughs> take care of the details. Um, I hope my green bona fides are, are well enough established that I can get away with saying what I'm about to say, which is, I think one of the ways you have strength in any initiative is to recognize when the other side has a point. And as long as I've been in the save the environment business, which is decades, we've heard people warn us that Vermont is in danger of becoming a theme park. Uh, that ultimately this has to be a place where people make a living. And as, as attractive as it is, the idea of the state acquiring land and managing it for, to preserve it, uh, which I suppose in a perfect world, I would support unequivocally. But the problem with, with that is that uh, I don't think the taxpayers can afford enough land to pull that off. If we're going to preserve the forests, I think we have to do it in a way that is compatible with private landowners, if not making a profit off the land, at least making their taxes. And um, uh, I'm wondering, is, is, is that with this? So I'm stepping back, talk about big picture. The, the whole general thrust of this conversation. Uh, Jamie, do, do, do you see us working towards a an economically viable arrangement for the private landowners that makes it in their interest to preserve forest land. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you have a chance to look at these recommendations that I pulled out, you'll see those themes there. It is about making sure that landowners have the right tools to address the carrying cost of land, the economic opportunities, whether they're incentives like carbon incentives, um, viable forestry operations as an economic output. Um, um, all of these are considered, and there's no doubt. I mean, that, that's you're, you're getting to the heart of the matter of how we ultimately probably need to make this, this work. It really needs to work for, for landowners. And I think as you've highlighted before, if we only focus on incentives though, we continue to see this trend, this land use trend. And so that's why, you know, VNRC continues to focus on making sure the land use side of it is still in play because they've got to be, we've got to figure out how to balance it all uh, to make it work for landowners and uh, to reverse these trends. But yes, very much in our thinking. Well, you know, it, it has always been dismaying uh, how vehement many uh, multi-generational native Vermonters, how vehement they are in their opposition to environmental protection. I think it goes back to the New Deal and what they look what they're looking at is the Southern Appalachians where uh, the government pre preserved paradise by kicking the people off the land. <laughs> and that's what, they, that's what they see coming in Vermont. It's never happened. It's no one's intention. But I think a lot of people have, have been for the last 75, 80 years have, have, have been afraid that that's what's coming. 
And that's what they're defending themselves from. Um, that's an observation. <laughs> Senator McCormick, uh, last yes. question, comment to you, and then we need to wrap. Uh, no, I'm I, done. I, I I'm do good. need to. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I know you've got Senator McDonald and, and uh, I in the queue. So, Senator McDonald. So, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, the, what the statistics and the information and that we have don't focus on what I think one of the main challenges is, and that is the death of the people who own the large tracts today and their wills and to whom the land is conveyed, um, often in being broken up into parcels amongst grandchildren and children. Um, and a, a tangential one, the um, folks who own land that were investments and now sell it to send their kids to college so that their kids don't have to have um, a huge debt when they graduate. Um, that's what is, is pushing the, the sales. And the sales go to people um, in the first, in the 15 towns that were listed who live out of state and find that the land is a good investment, not an investment for forestry, but a good investment for resale. That's what's going, appears to be what's going on at the same time that the markets for, for wood products are on the decline, um, that the mills are not taking as much, and that when you sell the, the product from forest lands, it doesn't recoup the amount of money it used to recoup. And those are, I think those are the driving factors that lead us to the statistics about the land itself, not the ownership, not about the demographics, to the land itself and why the land itself is being broken up into small pieces. If you don't deal with these, these economic things that are going on, the list of facts about how the land is being broken up um, doesn't provide the uh, learning why it's being broken up. So thank you. Thank you, Senator and McDonald. Uh, Senator Campion. Yeah, I, I think Senator McDonald brings up a, an excellent point. And you know, we can educate wealthy monitors all, you know, and, and, we, and it sounds like we, we are and we should be, but we, I feel like in a way we need to be helping economically Vermonters that again, might be needing to break up their land and, 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 and helping them so that, so that they don't have to. Uh, my final uh, question is uh, for, what did we end up doing with the road rule? And what was uh, last year? I, I, so many things are- So it traveled in a bigger bill um, yeah, the, go the governor vetoed that bill. Right. So that's you know, and that's where I I don't remember where Commissioner Snyder was on the road rule. Uh, but these are the kinds of I mean, these are these are land use policies that uh, you know concern me coming from from the administration on these kinds of things. So it's a bigger question. I appreciate this back and forth. I appreciate the willingness to start to really look at what's being put forward uh, and having a critical eye coming from, from others on what we can be doing better. So, so thank you. All right. Well, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Fidel. Clearly you've touched on a topic of real interest to the committee and we could uh, spend a lot more time. So I'm sorry at the moment we're constrained and thank you for all the good information. I think we will have some committee time for discussion on how, as a committee, we would like to think about following up. So again, with an idea of hitting the ground running next January, but uh, not just sort of mothball everything for the, the seven months we'll be out of session. All right. So uh, thank you so much. Um, and we'll move forward now to uh, then a, another piece of looking at the um, forestry landscape you know, so the, the longest title for this next section is Vermont Opportunities, Sustainable Forestry in the Wood Products Industry. Um, uh, we can, uh, we have three folks joining us this morning. Um, and I'll just spell out where, where the invitation came from. Uh, having spent my first five years in the legislature on the Ag Committee in a sector that's been under, remains under stress, but uh, stressed by virtue of having production of a product that uh, doesn't pay generally enough uh, income to people to um, 
you know, make a, uh, well, I'll just say there's a lot of pressure on the, the, the dairy community. We're losing a lot of dairy farms. It's a difficult situation. We're also losing ag land. Um, one of the ways we address that, uh, we've been through innovative programs and one of the people leading those innovative programs has been uh, Ellen Kaler at the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and others. So um, I uh, wanted to ask Ms. Kaler, Mr. Hancock, Ms. McGowan in to help us think uh, about innovation. Uh, you know, I think there's there are bright spots uh, and uh, along with all the disturbing trends, want to equip ourselves to look at some productive pathways forward. I guess that might be another way to look at it. Um, so I have my, that's enough of a preamble and uh, I'll let you all take it from here and uh, use the time that we have an hour plus, uh, divide it amongst yourselves, move back and forth. We don't need to list a list. You have witnesses one, two, three in order, but really um, I'm thinking of the three of you as working together and you can use, divvy the time up and we'll jump in with questions from time to time. So thanks so much for um, joining us this morning. Yeah, thank you so much senators for the invitation. Uh, I'm not sure whether I've actually ever presented to your committee, Senator Bray, uh, at this point, given that I spend most of my time over on the ag committees, uh, but very happy to be here because uh, uh, the Sustainable Jobs Fund has historically been very active in the wood products space uh, in the sector. And so I wanted to uh, make sure that you had met uh, Christine McGowan, who was our wood products uh, program director, um, and to let you know a little bit about the Vermont wood, the forest industry network, uh, and also to have Charlie Hancock join us because he uh, is on the, he is the incoming vice chair of the Working Lands Enterprise Board, is a consulting forester by training uh, and has a company uh, uh, doing just that and is also on the steering committee for the Vermont uh, Forest Industry Network. So we're really coming at to you as more of as a package, so to speak. And Senator Bray, if you wouldn't mind um, uh, share, let, giving me screen share ability, we have a very short slide deck uh, that we would great. love to share with you and you, walk through. You already have it. I'm sorry, oh, great, sorry. I didn't realize that, thank you so much. Okay. Um, so what we're what we're hoping to do over the course of the hour um, with you and and uh, I, we have a very short presentation. So our preference would be if this is okay with the committee would be to walk through the presentation uh, and then really just have open space for discussion and dialogue um, uh, and and take the conversation where you want to take it. So um, what we're, we're we're hoping to do is provide just a very brief overview that really touches on the uh, forest economy side of, of the equation, where your your last conversation with with Jamie Fidel was at, um, and then have Christine talk a little bit about the purpose of the forest industry network, uh, some project examples, and who the people are involved. Uh, and then Charlie will spend some time on the uh, working the forest the Working Lands Enterprise Board's forestry committee focus and purpose. Um, and then he's got some additional reflections as somebody who's very engaged in the industry uh, with woodland owners, as well as as a consulting forester dealing with loggers, dealing with log truckers uh, and mill owners uh, up through the chain, and then have plenty of time for your questions. So that's where we're hoping to go here. All right. so, Sounds excellent. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so the just a, a quick snapshot of the industry side of the equation. Um, as you can see, uh, over the last almost 20 years, we have had a steady decline in the number of forest products businesses in the state. Uh, and, and those businesses range from logging to manufacturing to facilitating the flow of, of logs uh, to, man, to other furniture manufacturing and construction, paper manufacturing, and overall tree production, like uh, in, the, in the form of, of Christmas tree farms. Um, so there's been a 21% decline in the number of businesses over the last almost 20 years. Uh, and that's been really concerning to us, even the, basically the industry didn't uh, ever recover uh, from the Great Recession. Uh, they took a, a huge hit uh, during that time and, uh, and just have not been able to recover. 
Um, on the jobs front, then there's also been a steady decline. We have gone from a high of uh, 9,700 back in 2002 down to the latest data that's available in 2019 is uh, 58.59. Uh, so a 40% decline over that time. And again, mirrors uh, the, the business loss in the sector. Um, so th this has been concerning to us is part of the reason why the Jobs Fund has always been involved in the sector in different ways, trying different uh, programmatic uh, areas to, to, to try to reverse these trends. It is not easy because uh, it is a, an industry, as you know, that's very much a commodity industry for by and large for the largest portion of the businesses in the state uh, operate in a commodity marketplace where they are price takers and not price makers. And similarly to conventional dairy where uh, they don't control the price and thus are really at the um, throes of the a lot of outside decision makers, um, they have really struggled. And so our orientation has been, how can we try to identify those uh, forest products business owners that are interested in innovating and, uh, and uh, looking for new market opportunities where they could actually become price makers. So uh, Senator Bray thought it might be helpful to give you just a, a little snapshot of the way the industry is laid out in the entire supply chain. And our work at the Sable Jobs Fund is really about uniting the entire supply chain, taking a, a systems level view of the industry. So that includes uh, the 82 uh, percent, the, the fact that 82 percent of our, of our forest land uh, is privately owned by 87 thousand Vermonters or other landowners. Some of it is, out, is owned by the land trust and, and other outside entities. Um, those forests then, uh, a, a number of them, uh, some percentage of them, and Charlie can provide that uh, information, are, are overseen by consulting foresters, um, both independently, uh, independent ones, as well as ones that are, that are in the current use program and, and serviced by the department. There are loggers uh, and there are log truck drivers uh, that move material uh, then to the primary mills and the kilns around the state. This the primary mills uh, have been a have taken a significant hit in the last 20 years. We have many fewer mills than we used to have. Uh, we don't have any independent kiln dryers left in the state, is my understanding. And uh, but some of the larger mills have kiln capacity on site, so they're they're controlling their own kiln kiln capacity. Um, once it leaves the mill, it tends to go in two general directions. It either goes towards uh, the 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 mills are creating lumber with it, or they're creating some form of biomass. And I know that biomass is also an, an area of interest to your committee because of the clean energy, the clean energy uh, plan and uh, the comprehensive energy plan. And it provides, um, uh, and so many Vermonters still heat their homes with wood. So this is an important subsector. Uh, and as you can see that biomass then either is transformed into energy products like, such as kiln uh, dried wood or uh, pellets, wood pellets, or uh, wood chips for schools, heating, and other uh, larger heating units. And then, or it gets transformed into mulch and sawdust and byproducts, which service uh, uh, the agency of transportation and the landscaping industry and homeowners and such. Uh, on the, or if that those logs, as they are uh, sawn up, go into some form of lumber. Uh, some, in some cases, whole veneer logs are going on shipping containers uh, and shipped over to China for uh, the making of, of furniture uh, in, in China with, with that high quality of veneer. Um, and, uh, or it's being turned into actual lumber that then is sent uh, in many directions for many different purposes from uh, creating wood products like our incredible furniture makers in the state or construction for our homes and our businesses, um, or is sold in retail in hardwood stores, in hardware stores. So there are also a, a large number of organizations that provide a variety of services. And I was, uh, apologies for the text that accidentally went to everyone. I was realizing that uh, we neglected to put VNRC on this uh, graphic. 
uh, and was saying we need to Christine, a message to just to go to Christine to say, we really want to figure out a way to connect with the forest roundtable to get them engaged uh, with the forest industry network we've been developing. Um, so there are a large number of organizations, not as large as the ag sector, uh, supporting the industry from trade associations like the Vermont Woodlands Association, and the uh, Vermont Forest Products Association, the Vermont Woodworks Council, uh, Vermont Green Building Network, and, Vermont, and Renewable Energy Vermont, for instance, and different parts of that, of that supply chain. Uh, and then you have regional entities like the Northern Forest Center that really takes a look at the entire Northern Forest region. And then you have uh, the government agencies that are very much involved in the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative that's uh, administered by the Agency of Agriculture, but by statute, as you know, includes the Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation and the, and the uh, Secretary of Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And then you have uh, service providers that support business development. So helping develop business plans, uh, access to capital, helping to prepare grant applications, uh, looking at enterprises, thinking about new market opportunities. And those live at the Vermont Housing Conservation's Farm and Forest Viability Program, at the Jobs Fund, and also at UVM Extension. And the Northern Forest Center also does some work uh, with technical and business assistance on the secondary manufacturer side as well. So we have this, this is sort of the system's view of the, the, the sort of key players uh, in the industry. And as I mentioned, we neglected to put the forest round table on that and clearly need to update this graphic um, accordingly. So I wanna um, hand it over now to, to Christine to give you a little sense about the industry network. And again, this is from a systems view of, of the kinds of things that we're trying to move forward to support uh, the ability of Vermont forests uh, being maintained as forests and used as working lands forests to support this important industry. And hopefully over the next 10, 15 years, be able to turn the curve and be able to uh, regrow the industry and its diversity and, and breadth because our, our forests are important to our landscape. Uh, they're important for climate purposes and carbon sequestration, but they also need to be sustainably managed and they feed and are the foundation of a lot of industry, a lot of uh, parts of our economy, not just the forest economy in the industry's perspective like we're showing you today, but as you know, uh, in terms of the tourism economy and, and the recreational economy, which we're not gonna address today, but is very much a part of, uh, the, for the working forest is very much a part of making those industries successful. So uh, with that, I'll leave you to uh, Christine here and I'll advance the slides along uh, as Christine moves us through. Great, thank you very much. Welcome Ms. McGowan. Thank you and thanks for uh, inviting us in to talk. Um, so I'm Christine McGowan and I do uh, direct the Forest Products Program at the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund and also am the coordinator of the Vermont Forest Industry Network that I'll talk a little bit about, but just by way of background since I've never been uh, in front of this committee before. Um, my background is actually in conservation and in strategic communications. Um, I've worked for three national conservation groups for about 15 years, TNC, uh, National Wildlife Refuge Association. And for 10 years, I was with the National Wildlife Federation, was their communications director. So um, my background really is in conservation and specifically in communications, um, strategic communications around those uh, issues. But also um, I would just wanna mention that I am also a small business owner in Stowe, Vermont. My husband and I own a paint contracting firm. So we work with the construction community in our area. So I can certainly vouch for uh, Jamie's discussion on fragmentation and, and all of the uh, interesting things happening in resort communities like Stowe. Um, but I wanna talk with you today a little bit about the Vermont Forest Industry Network and just um, give you an overview of, of that work, um, why it was created and uh, some of the work that's been happening and then really looking at the future of, of what that work will be uh, moving down the pike. Um, you know, Ellen touched on, uh, there are a lot of players in, in the arena and really uh, several years ago, the Working Lands Enterprise Board Forestry Committee got together and commissioned a study to really look at what this industry needs moving forward. Um, and so ultimately what came out of a report uh, that was done back in 2016 was the industry said, look, we really need to 
collaborate more, come together as sort of a network. There really wasn't something. There's lots of trade organizations, but nothing really that brings everyone together. So the jobs fund sort of raised their hand and said, hey, we know something about running a network. So maybe we could help uh, in this arena. So I came on board in 2016 and throughout the course of the, the first year or so, began working to create some groups, some what we called action teams to start to look at some of the priority areas that the industry said that it really wanted to, to look more closely at. So uh, I'll touch a little bit on, on a couple of examples of that, but really um, the idea here was, we know that this industry is really foundational to the forest economy in Vermont, and you know which does include recreation and, and maple production, but we wanna focus in on what we can do to help the working landscape, the working forests and the businesses and the people that are actually um, really helping to keep our forests intact as forests. Um, so the network, we established it in 2018, uh, sort of officially at our first summit that we put together up at Burke uh, Mountain Resort. Uh, we've had two of those summits um, in the before times when we could have in-person uh, gatherings. We have, it's attracted 150 people each time. So it's been a great place to bring people together to talk about the trending issues um, in the industry and sort of the challenges, what are some of the opportunities that businesses and um, people in that space can take advantage of. Um, but really it's, it's meant to create this space for collaboration. That's what this network is all about. Um, and to try to help the businesses diversify and find new markets for wood products, uh, expand existing markets for wood products to keep that, you know, to keep the industry whole. Um, so we composed a steering committee that um, brings together all the different trade organizations. So the Woodlands Association, VFPA, the uh, Woodworks Council, REV, um, all together represent on the, the steering committee as well as the agencies. So those, all of those logos you saw um, have some representation on our steering committee um, and are really trying to work on you know, zoning in on what does this industry really need uh, to move forward. So as I mentioned, we've hosted a couple of summits but we've also, I touched on these action teams and I'll talk about one just as an example of some of the act activity that's been happening. So one of the areas of great interest uh, was mass timber. So I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but it's really an umbrella term that um, refers to a, a whole host of engineered wood products that are used in building. Um, it's gaining a lot of momentum in other parts of, certainly in other parts of the world, but in North America, um, it's, it's just starting to gain a lot of interest and um, excitement. So we're interested in, well, what would it look like in our region um, to really support a mass timber industry so we can build, uh, get away from uh, uh, materials like steel and concrete, but actually build more with wood. And we have this incredible resource here in the Northeast, uh, sustainably managed forests that could support that industry. So we created a team of people looking into what might Vermont's role be in this. Um, and there are a lot of ancillary opportunities, I think, for Vermont uh, to play in this arena. One of the things that came out of, we, we did a whole host of educational events for um, mostly the, the design build community, um, architects, engineers, designers, et cetera. Um, we hosted a meetup to talk about embodied carbon in building. And at that meetup, the uh, executive director of the Fairbanks Museum attended and he got very interested in mass timber because they were looking to um, do an expansion project at the museum. And long story short, uh, he was able to make connections through that effort um, to some of the right people to help him to put together a package, a plan for that expansion to become a mass timber demonstration project. So um, the good news is they are moving forward with that. Uh, he was successful at raising the funds to do that. So I believe they're going to be breaking ground probably any day. Uh, and this mass timber action or this mass timber demonstration project um, will actually serve as an educational opportunity for really the region, but um, people in the design build community to learn more about this. And it will be a permanent display on the use of mass timber um, in, you know, in building. So we're very excited uh, that that kind of came out of some of the work of the network. Um, so we've done some other um, meetups on different types of topics. We will continue to do that. 
Um, we're excited to, to look into some of the newer opportunities that are coming down the pike. Um, things like textiles, wood-based textiles. Again, this is happening in other parts of the world. Um, we wanna look at what might it look like to reinvigorate um, wood-based textiles here in the region and what role might Vermont play? Um, so we're, we're looking at things like that. I'm also excited, uh, there's a project happening that again, sort of grew out of the network. Um, the Northern Vermont University and Do North Coworking um, in Lindenville developed a, a proposal to launch a forest economy business accelerator program that will be based at Do North. And so we've been actually helping them um, put together a business plan for that. And that is something that will attract entrepreneurs, not only from Vermont and our region, but really we're looking to attract them from all over. People who want to expand businesses um, in the forest products arena, looking at whether it's new products or expanding existing product lines, um, how can we help those businesses to do more faster? How can we accelerate their growth? So very excited about that project moving forward. Um, and also I just, I did wanna to touch on sort of so where are we seeing where some of the, the investments need to be made in the state? And I think that, you know, in general, this uh, industry needs more investment um, from the state of Vermont. And I, I think of things like looking at our 90% renewable by 2050 goal, um, we really need to look at, you know, what percentage of that is going to need to come from wood uh, thermal wood heat. And so we, I think we've said 35% by 2030. And in order to make that a reality, we really need to invest more in looking at how can we help, whether it's our schools, you know, we were the leader in converting schools to wood heat back in the 80s and 90s. Many of those schools actually need to um, uh, replace or upgrade those that equipment to new modern wood heat systems. So how can we help make that happen? How can we help other large uh, campuses, whether it's hospitals, colleges, industrial parks? I mean, they could all be using um, that for their thermal load, um, modern wood heat. So that's an area where we could invest that, you know, all the infrastructure, uh, you know, is, is there today. So really, it's just a matter of helping um, move this along even more. So I think that's a, a place of investment. Um, certainly the Clean Energy Development Fund is a place where you know, we would like to see more investment there so that uh, we can help businesses and, and communities convert away from fossil fuel and into uh, modern wood heat. Um, another place is really to, to look at that investment in our sawmill infrastructure in the state. Um, as you probably all know, uh, you know, just about every town in Vermont used to have a sawmill. And today we've got maybe 40 to 50 uh, independent sawmills left in the state. That number is dwindling. Um, and it, it's certainly a concern because that infrastructure, um, once it's gone, it's really difficult to get back and we don't wanna lose that. So what can we be doing as a state to really support the industry to make sure that the succession planning for those mills um, and the ability for those mills to, um, to continue in the future is gonna be there. Um, you know, I wanted to uh, introduce you, I guess, to a few of the, the people in this network because I don't know uh, how many of you are familiar with the industry and really the people and the businesses in this industry. So Ellen, if you wanna um, flip the slides, I'll just briefly touch on a few of the people who are active um, in the industry and in this network. So some of you may know Ken Ganya, owner of Ganya Lumber in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, he recently utilized $120,000 working lands grant to extend three-phase three power to his sawmill, replacing diesel generation with grid power. Um, so it's really for him looking at the future and um, making sure that his mill will be viable for someday a new owner. Um, I think this was a huge step forward. And so that was a great uh, example of an investment made that helped him to do that. Um, you can hit the next slide, Ellen. So this is Heath Bunnell. Um, he's a really avid mountain biker and trail builder up in the Northeast Kingdom. He's also a master logger and he owns uh, Kirby Mulch in Kirby, Vermont. So he received $130,000 working lands enterprise grant to produce high quality mulch. Um, and really he wanted to expand from the work that he does processing kiln dried firewood to utilize byproduct for another product. And so again, another great investment, um, somebody who is you know, really looking to the future um, and so I, I was pleased to see that investment. This is Trevor Allard. He's vice president of Allard Lumber down in Brattleboro. Um, they recently installed a new combined heat and power system that utilizes waste wood from their sawmill 
to supply heat for their kilns and to generate electricity. It's a great example of the kind of innovation that's that's happening in the industry. And you know, it's a good example for other manufacturers in the state to consider uh, looking into systems like this that do exist. So this is Chrissy Heinrich and Matt Clark, and they own the startup Whiteout Solutions in Lindenville, um, where they've developed a specialized drone technology for forest mapping and inventory. So a great example of um, you know, young people really looking at new types of businesses that will really support the industry. This is Creston Lee. Um, so any of you who are music lovers, um, he makes custom guitars in Burlington, um, probably makes 50 to 60 of them a year. Um, and just in this photo, there's a, uh, the neck of this guitar was made with Vermont maple. So again, these are um, artisans that are in our state that are utilizing our, our local wood resource. So this is um, Ali Kasiba. She is the Vermont State Climate Forester. And I do wanna give a shout out to the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation for having the foresight to create a position like this. Um, as you all know, you know, climate and carbon storage and really looking at what the, both how our forests can be a solution for climate change, but also what are the impacts that our forests are having because of climate change. So bringing this type of expertise to the state is, is a huge step in the right direction. I'm really thrilled um, to have Ali as a resource in the state. And um, you know we certainly wanna have more of that. So this is uh, Catherine Emil and Jared Williams, who a few years back, they attended Vermont Woodworking School in Fairfax to learn the craft of woodworking and they started a small business. Um, and quite literally, as of a few months ago, they now own the school. So we're really excited to see what they have in store for Vermont Woodworking School for the future. So these are just a sampling of the kinds of people that are out there in our forest products industry. Um, to learn more, uh, we, we, as part of the work that we do for the network um, to raise the profile of this industry, we've been profiling people and businesses throughout the whole supply chain. And those stories are all found on our website. So vsjf.org slash news. Um, so feel free to look there. And we also do a newsletter. So if you would like more information, um, you are more than welcome to join uh, our email list and, and we will get you on there. And so you can keep tabs on what's happening in the industry. So with that, I wanna turn things over to another um, member of the network. He's a member of our steering committee and also on the Working Lands Enterprise Board. Uh, and a consulting and licensed forester in Vermont, Charlie Hancock. I will turn it over to you. Thanks a lot, Christine, and thank you, Senators, for the opportunity yeah. to talk to you today about this. Um, Good morning, Mr. Hancock. Great to great to see you again. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, happy to. More than happy to. Um, so, as Ellen and Christine mentioned, um, I do serve on the Working Lands Enterprise Board. I'm the incoming vice chair, um, and the arm of the board that works primarily in this space is the Forestry Committee. Um, and their role is really to help identify the current challenges and opportunities across this entire supply chain that Ellen laid out to see where we can really catalyze the best impact with our grant making process, kind of where's the bang for our buck going to go based on the issues that we see. And so, you know, one of the biggest ones that I can put an example on would be the low grade wood issues. And so the community is wrestling with how do we, how do we make an impact there that can address these challenges and really leverage these opportunities. Um, another thing that the board or the committee works on is developing innovative strategies and tools for the board that can catalyze growth and leverage outside money. And so it's something important to remember when we talk about WeLab is that there's funding that comes from the state of Vermont, but the um, Working Lands Enterprise Board, part of our work is leveraging outside dollars. You know, we, we usually leverage about a two to one or even a three to one ratio um, in terms of, of financial commitment. So, um, it's, it's an important part of our work as a board. Um, thinking about past funding allocations and kind of where, where the board and the forestry committee have looked, you know, we, we tend, tend to give out um, three different phases of grants over the past few years. One would be kind of the standard business grant. Those are around $5,000 to $25,000. Something like that to think about would be a logging contractor that wants to add a firewood processor to diversify their business and would result in the addition of one or two more FTEs to their, to their business. Um, another kind of grant that we, uh, that we offer is a supply chain impact grant. Those are higher dollar values. Those are around $25,000 to $75,000. You know, those are really infrastructure improvements that increase production, processing, distribution, 
across multiple enterprises and leverage supply chain partnerships. Because one of the big things we want to do here is connect parts of those supply chains to really leverage greater impact. An example of that would be a kiln project that we had in Caledonia County to really increase the capacity there for, for kiln drying. And then we have our market level impact grants. Those are the ones that are like 50 to $150,000. Um, the project that uh, Christine mentioned at Gagne's sawmill getting three-phase power there is a great example of this one. And these are projects that some develop new markets looking at certain sector specific needs, again, looking at low grade wood, but they're also looking at large scale um, production and processing, you know, scales that have the potential to broaden impact across the entire industry. So every year the, the, the board and the committee or the, commi uh, the committee comes together to think about where are these priority areas? How are we gonna allocate funds um, in this funding cycle to really make the biggest impact we can in this space? And you know, looking forward, you know, next year, you know, we're gonna be having a, a, a symposium in a couple of months with the whole board to really hash this out and figure out where, where can we invest dollars? Where can we make the biggest impact? And it's looking like we have a pretty massive opportunity here, right? The, the budget's shaping up to maybe put about $5.5 million into the Working Lands Enterprise Fund. And that is massive. That is a, a, a massive opportunity um, that we haven't seen ever before with the, this board's work. Um, the flip side of that coin is that it's only 5.5 million. <laughs> um, and that has to be split between the forestry sector and the ag sector. You know, our challenge is that we have three to four times the demand every year than we have in available funding. And that's demand, I would separate demand in terms of projects that come that we look at and we say, that's great, thanks. But these are demand of projects that have a valid merit to them, things that we want to fund, but we can't because we don't have the capacity to. So and frankly, we need more money and we have to go bigger with our investments. You know, this is an incredibly capital intensive industry and turning that ship is, takes time and it takes money. And we have to also think about how we do that in Vermont. You know, we, we operate in this, this regional space that covers our part of the Northern Forest from New York to Maine up into Quebec, but we're not Maine, we're not New Hampshire, we're certainly not Quebec. And so we have to think about what infrastructure improvements, what investments can we make here in Vermont that really position us, us to be strength and strong. You know, as Ellen said, when you're, um, when you're subject to these, these, these women's of global commodity markets and price points being set elsewhere, we're not, control, we're not in control of our future. Um, and so that's what we really need to do is to get in control of our future. And so Christine, um, you know, listed a lot of investment areas that I would love to dig in more, you know, as we open up the conversation around infrastructure and investment, whether it's within sawmill capacity or the associated um, infrastructure areas around power, you know, new products, advanced wood heat, workforce development, um, construction and design, kind of expanding the lens that we see this through. Um, and I would also kind of say in terms of additional investment in these areas, I, I'd say that we need to continue to reframe this sector. You know, Senator Westman made a comment during Jamie's um, presentation about public perception. Um, and I think that that's something that we need to really do in this industry as well, is to raise visibility and raise commitment because, you know, it's not just about boards and cords. You know, these are future oriented issues. This industry lies at the heart of natural climate solutions. And so I serve on the um, Vermont Climate Council. You know, this, this is at the center of our work there. So we need to be able to see this industry through that lens. Um, this is also about rural economic development. You know, it's not just about bringing broadband to every mile and getting wastewater in every village. And I say that as somebody leading a $12 million wastewater project here in Montgomery. You know, these are important things if our rural communities are gonna survive. Um, so we need to kind of broaden the lens that we look at and, and really kind of see this industry for what it is and what it means to the state. And I think that we need to be really intentional about our work. You know, that's gonna take planning and it, you know, really kind of developmental orientation and it's gonna take collaboration and communication. Um, I'd argue that we need a parallel to the um, Ag Strategic Plan, Farm to Plate, and Act 84 for forestry. We need to bring these people together. We need to look at our future. And it's not just about developing a roadmap, it's about the process of bringing them together because that's what catalyzes connections, partnerships, collaboration, and that's what we really need in this space. So, um, you know, I, I can't wait to open up the discussion bigger about these opportunities. Um, but I also can't help but just take a moment to look backwards. Um, 
turn of the last century, about four miles up the road from here, there was a mill that produced bobbins that were shipped across the United States. It employed 250 people. The mill's gone. You can see the foundation of it kind of still, but it's not here anymore. Um, you know, another four miles the other direction, going back to the early part of the last century, you would have found a mill that produced um, boxes. And if you were to buy a Victrola record player anywhere in the world, you'd get it shipped to you in a box that was stamped Atlas Plywood Company, Montgomery, Vermont. You know, there's, there's history here. Um, it's foundational to these communities and we're starting to become like a generation removed from that. I used to hear stories from um, Gaston Benash here in town about when he used to go down to the mill during their lunch break to, um, to, to just hang out with the workers. And he'd tell stories about kind of all the things that would happen and the associated benefits to the communities and the action and the energy around that. And we're losing those people. And I think there's a, there's a risk there that as we kind of become removed from that, we, we kind of not become blind, but we kind of turn away from the fact that this is a shared identity that's foundational to our rural communities and our state. And so I think we really need to kind of turn back to that and see how important that is to, to what we're doing, what we're talking about here. So with that, I really want to open it up to, to bigger discussion and questions. So thanks for that opportunity. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Um, and Mr. Hancock, you, you alluded to some of the other hats you wear. Um, and I'm wondering if you could help um, explain from your point of view, especially as a working forester, the role that you see on the commercial side and how it connects to forced health and stemming the tide on uh, losing uh, forest land. Yeah, so I think um, when we think about keeping forests as forests, right? That's the, that's the name of the game. When we come to like how we wanna look at our forests in the future. Okay. There's, there's different kind of tiers or avenues or veins to that. Um, Jamie has been talking about um, a number that are critically important around land use planning, around policy, around conservation, easements, things like that. Those are all critically important to um, keeping our forests intact. Another equally important part of that is keeping our forests economically viable to, to own and maintain. Um, one of the biggest challenges for landowners around here is, is just that. How do, we, how do we cover the carrying costs of, these, of owning these lands. And most ownerships that I work with and, and most of the you know, 87,000 landowners in Vermont, I'd argue that the vast majority of them, they're not owning it because they, they hear that cha-ching, 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 because that's not really there. They own it because they love the land. They love what it means to them. They love the wildlife. They love the recreation components. But that industry component, that commercial component is still critically important to the mix here. If you can't afford to own forest land, it's gonna change hands and it's gonna to go to different uses and it's gonna to go to conversion. So keeping the industry strong is critically important to, to that. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And um, one quick question, cause it's come up a number of times in different committees this year is the low grade wood future and its role in forest health. You know, the from the forest, Biomass Energy Development Working Group years ago, I mean, my take home lesson was that uh, harvesting is so expensive that you need to do an integrated harvest. And that means while you're in there, you're taking out low grade wood and um, finding a market for that as well. That's, can you, is, is that still sort of the rule of thumb? Integrated oh, yeah. harvesting is the only way to be in the woods. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we grow some of the most beautiful timber in the world here, like hands down, second to none, it's us, we grow that. Um, but we also grow a lot of fill in the expletive, right? Um, and as part of managing our forests, we need to remove that. You know, if, if we don't have the capacity to remove that, what we're doing is high grading. We're going in, we're cutting the best, we're leading the rest. And that's causing degradation of forest health, value, all the associated benefits that we look at around, you know, climate change resiliency or water quality. Um, you know, so we need markets for low grade wood. Without markets for low grade wood, we cannot practice the kind of forest management that we want to see, forest management that's critical to these broader objectives that we have as a state. And that that sector, that space in this supply chain, I mean, I could say it's it's blown up, and I could say that literally, it's blown up. You know, a, a pulp mill in Maine, the Pixel Mill, blew up last year. Other mains have closed, and even though it's not happening here in Vermont, it's creating a domino effect that we're seeing. We're seeing price depressions 
and it's it's created real challenges. I can't tell you how many jobs this past year we've we've not done, we've paused on because we don't have a market for the low grade wood. And it's not a case of like the price is kind of down, and so we kind of want to wait. It's like we can't sell it. There's still chip piles yep. across Franklin County and elsewhere, I'm sure, that we can't move. Um, and so without the, the economic viability of that part of the marketplace, it basically just puts a big stopper in the rest of it. So right. yes, low grade is incredibly important, but it's also an incredibly big opportunity. You know, you think about these, these um, places we're looking at developing as far as energy sector development or, or advanced wood heat. We want to move Vermont away from fossil fuels. You know, that's how we do it. You know, we want to reduce our climate emissions and associated uh, impacts there. You know, this is a place to look. And it's not the only one, you know, wind, solar, all those are important in the mix. But without this, we're just going to be treading water. Right. I think another bottom line for that biomass energy working group was we could safely, sustainably, healthily harvest roughly 40% more annually than we were. And I know that, that wasn't without controversy, um, but... Uh, all right, so that opportunity remains. And for me, the, then the connection back is if ultimately landowners don't have these opportunities, at some point, someone perhaps with um, real regret may end up uh, selling land off. Or the other thing we talked about <clears throat> was interge intergenerational transfer, that custodian uh, dies and the heirs aren't as interested as the, the deceased was in keeping the land. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah, and there's work happening, work happening in that space too. I mean, we often talk about farmland succession um, and that's incredibly important, but forest land succession is equally as important. And so working with these families to understand how that intergenerational transfer is gonna happen or the generational transfer that might be outside of the family. You know, we think about farms that transfer to these young and up and coming farmers that might not have a direct relationship in the family tree, but they're equally as important. And that same thing is true in the forest space. Sure. Um, Senator Westman. I, I have just a comment about um, the generational transfer as someone who within the last two years just went through that generational transfer um, and what, what family members do with the property when it gets that. It has to be economical within that, um, um, in some respects, within that generational transfer. But a, a huge part of this issue is not just the generational transfer. It's the people that are out there with um, huge resources that come in and say, I'll buy your land. And then what we do is we allow them to break the land up and continue to get a tax break and have uh, 27 acres and have a park around their house because mm -hmm. they have come from uh, away. So it isn't just about the families that have the land that are transferring it. It's the people that are coming up to buy it. Yeah, no argument there, you know, as far right. as the transfer of ownership and ownership objectives too. You know, your, your point about people who might come up just to sit around and have a park, you know, not, that's a bad thing, but the ownership objectives have changed or are changing or are at risk of changing. And that has a big impact on the industry and everything we're talking about. Um, so uh, any, we've covered a lot of territory th this morning. Uh, and I, I'm just wondering if other members of the committee have questions or comments um, about so we've shifted gears from sort of a, the VNRC perspective to a, a more working lands perspective and an industry to support it. Um, it's good news to hear that the, the um, appropriation of working lands is going up. Um, the challenge is always, if it's one-time money coming through, how do you build and sustain um, that kind of innovation? Having done this work on, um, this may be a question for, Ellen, having done this sort of transformational work on farm to plate, where I think we've seen some pretty good numbers coming back in terms of businesses founded, number of people finding work in the food uh, food sector. Um, well, how do you see the two side by side? Are you as optimistic? And do you see as, are we, uh, I guess it comes back a little bit in part to this whole perception thing. 
people are much more intimate with about food and that that movement has really taken off in 10 years. I don't know if, how we get the same interest in force and wood products. Um, it's a really important question and it's multifaceted. There's no magic bullet. There's no one way to do this, right? I mean, part of why we uh, have been doing, that Christine's been leading is all of these articles uh, that that she referenced that are on our, our website and I, and I sent uh, links to, to you, Senator Bray, to share with the committee is because we, we feel like a lot of Vermonters are too removed from the forest economy, as Charlie said, and, and the kinds of, innovative uh, products and uh, processes and markets that we can in fact sell into where we can be price, make, price takers rather than price makers. And so we're trying to, through our communication strategy, really shed a light on these incredible entrepreneurs so that more people know that they're here and that they're, they're making just unbelievable products. But the fact of the matter is, uh, un unless, with the exception of the, the, the COVID times, uh, most people would buy, uh, you know, a really nice dining room table one time in their lifetime. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so uh, you don't, it's not the same kind of consumable that food is, obviously, to your point, Senator. And so we do have to think about a more developmental oriented approach. And that takes time. You know, when the low grade wood market really first blew apart, when the, the oh, so many mills went out in Maine, it was a big, huge, like, oh my gosh, we have to pull everybody together. We have to figure out how are we going to solve the low-grade wood market? Well, the low-grade wood market has existed, is an issue that has been building in this direction for way more than 50 years, probably 75, 80 years, because we have oriented, uh, because as Charlie mentioned, as we have so much low-grade material that needs a home, we have looked to selling that, that, those low-grade uh, products to Maine, to the mills in Maine. When those mills go out, there's nothing there. Like there, it, there's no other market to go to. So the only way out of that is to build new markets, and that takes time and intention and investment and focus, year after year after year. And it it, it is a slog. I mean, comparatively to what we've been able to make happen on the on the food side, it is a slot. That's why we need a diversity of products. We need a diversity of markets. We need a, a, a much bigger group of folks that are supporting uh, entrepreneurs to get into the marketplace with new innovative products, uh, because that's, that's going to be how we salvage and support the existing infrastructure, the mill infrastructure that Charlie was talking about and Christine was talking about. If we lose those mills, like it, it, it's going to be impossible to get it back. So we got to stabilize where we're at, stabilize the land base and forest ownership uh, and, and, and reduce fragmentation. And we need to be investing more in future products, future markets, uh, and, it, and to try to turn that chip in, in that direction. Great, Senator Campion. Thanks, uh, I appreciate this conversation. And for me, and, and this is a question that I think I need answers just for my own learning, others, may know it, uh, the answer, but so here we're, the chair is having us talk about, you know, the, the, the precipitous decline of forests in this state, 14,000 acres a year, huge, huge. I mean, anybody that's, uh, everybody recognizes this is a huge issue. Um, and I appreciate the role that you're all talking about with regard to forest health and how, you know, your sort of the wood industry is essential to that forest health, but make the connection between forest health, first of all, and, and you know, what you're doing and stopping this precipitous decline, this incredible decline that is happening year after year after year. So I think that might be for Charlie, uh, but if somebody else wants to weigh in, so that would be really helpful to me. Yeah, or maybe you could also say, you know, the chair's talking about two different things here, and that's fine too. No, no, I think I okay. think sometimes we 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 segment a lot of this stuff yeah. to our detriment because um, it's because it's all connected, and often often there's this you know industry conservation, you know, yeah, and it, right. it shouldn't be like that, you know. This is all of this is working together moving forward, and so again, we think about things like land use policy, whether we're talking about Act Two Hundred and Fifty or we're talking about 
um, conservation easements or things like that. Um, you know, th those tools, as I said, those are critically important to maintaining forests as forests. Um, but this other element of how do we bring in these other income streams to these landowners? And, and it isn't just about wood, right? So we have a project yeah. here in Montgomery. It's the, it's the first aggregated carbon project ever in the country. We've taken about 10 landowners over 12 parcels spanning 7,000 acres and enrolled them in the voluntary carbon market. They're going to be seeing revenue coming in now yeah. from that um, annually. That's revenue that's going to offset their property tax liability. It's going to allow them to do improvement work in their forests. Otherwise, it would be non-commercial but they're also still harvesting high quality wood products. I mean, we're still sending logs on trucks to mills from those same properties. And so it's about diversifying. And we think about diversification at the industry level, right? So we need to diversify so that we've got mass timber as well as biomass, as well as fill in the blank. But when we think about our landowners, we also need to diversify kind of what their options and opportunities are um, to make sure that they, they have that full, full kind of, you know, palette or toolkit, you know, um, because that's that's what's going to help keep forests as forests is those economic opportunities as well. That's really helpful. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, very much. Great. Thank you for that. I would like to just add to that. Um, I Please. mean, when I think about forest health, you can't really, you can't keep our forests resilient in the face of climate change without a viable forest products industry made up of the professionals, whether they're the foresters, the loggers, the sawmills that that wood goes to, um, it doesn't work without it. So if we continue to lose that infrastructure and lose the people who are doing that work and doing it really well and responsibly, um, we are, I think that actually that literally the health and integrity of our forests is at great risk. So it's really in everybody's interest to keep this industry viable and as Charlie said, the way to do that is to really try to diversify the kinds of markets that they can buy, that they can sell into so that at any given time, if something happens in Maine, it's not going to have a detrimental effect on the businesses in Vermont. Yeah. And that part, I, you know, that I understood better than what, you know, what Charlie was just talking about making it, you know, I, I, I without a doubt, I completely recognize and appreciate the connection between the wood product industry and forest health and climate. The part that I was less clear on, but feel better about now is, is that, you know, in building these economies, you, you, you're going and you're helping that person with 200 acres to make it happen, to make it work, to keep it going. In other words, to keep it forest, if, if that makes sense, uh, or even bigger tracks, you know, so that they're not feeling that, that pressure to say, you know, we're going to sell this uh, and we're going to take, you know, the money and, um, it, you know, and do something else with it, you know, because we're feeling the economic pressure to do it. It still doesn't, you know, uh, we all know it's, it's one tool in the toolkit. We still know that there are families that are under huge economic pressures, as Senator McDonald said, paying for college tuition, uh, thinking about their own retirements, paying for health care debt. These kinds of things are huge. And these are other things that I think policy-wise, we really have to keep our eye on with our colleagues to make sure that you know, across the state, people aren't getting to those points of, gosh, you know, we just wanna send our children to, to college. And so we need to sell off half of the property to do that. that that's, I think, a lose-lose for, for, for everyone. Uh, what we'd like to be able to do is make sure those, those young people can go to college and not acquire the debt. So it doesn't force the family to, uh, to make, to be forced into that kind of decision. Well, so. and it's not only that, but when you think of the intergenerational transfer that we touched on earlier, um, if somebody, you know, wants his or her uh, kids to inherit that land and keep it as forest, but you've got two or three kids and maybe they did go to college and they accumulated a considerable amount of student debt, you know, can they really afford to keep that land? And, and right, the temptation right, yeah. going to be, hey, if I sell it off, right. that. I mean, so there's very real concerns about how that transfer happens and what's the economic uh, driver to keep those forests intact. Yeah, I, and I think the other piece that everybody's talked about that's really important, and I don't know how to get at this, is that education piece. You know, I've quite, you know, some, my family, a number of them are in Craftsbury, and, you know, they're on, 
you know, I, I don't know what they're thinking down the road, you know, toward, um, it, for all I know, it could be completely on their mind. You know, they, they may be planning, you know, they, they may know what they're doing in terms of the future with my cousins and all that. But I'm sure there are a lot of people that aren't. And, and I don't know how to, uh, to work to, to, to reach those people more and more. I know you all do, and, and I'm grateful for that. Um, but it, and if there are ways that this committee can connect with that work and support that work, um, you know, I just think in society, we all miss so much information, even though we're being flooded with information. And in some ways it's back to the old school, knocking on the door and saying, Hey, here's some information. Uh, it's kind of like what, what we're doing, all doing for our campaigns, you know, old school, it's the, the best way to, to talk to people. So appreciate the conversation. So I, I think to the, to the, to the, um, the point about kind of the, the family in Craftsbury facing this and not knowing where to turn. Um, we've talked a lot about um, direct investments in the industry. Um, another, another area that the board works in is working with service providers in the state. And we have got a, a huge you know, bench of service providers that work with families and businesses on that. And so more support that we can give to those organizations, the more people that they can work with. Um, similar to how much requests we get from partners, whether it's Forest Farm Viability at VHCB or the Northern Forest Center working in these areas, you know, we have more requests for funding to assist there than, than we can than we can give out money for. And so yeah. um, there, there, are, there are physical kind of built environment things to invest in, but there's also the investment in the people and the information transfer that we're seeing in those areas. And then lastly, I'd say that just in terms of visibility of some of these things, the state has a, a, a massive opportunity here to lead by example. You know, the procurement policies the state develops, um, you know, how, how they build, you know, th these are opportunities for the state to kind of, as I said, lead by example, you know, um, I can't tell you how many, how many times I've, I've gone by certain kinds of development things. I mean, last time I was in Montpelier, which granted was a long time ago, given COVID, um, the building that was going up behind the uh, Capitol Plaza, pretty sure that was being built with steel. You know, like where are the incentives? Where are the where are the, the demonstration things that we can hold up so that people see it and they they understand it? Because people only care about what they see. They only know what they see. And if they don't see it, they're not gonna care about it. And so part of our job is to elevate it to that place where people see this, they understand it, and they develop that connection to it. And that's what fosters the desire to protect it and work with it and really champion it. Yeah, great point. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, we're at time, unless there's, I don't want to cut anyone off. If anyone of our guests has anything more that they didn't get to that they'd like to share with us, happy to pause. Or if any committee member didn't get to ask a question or make a comment, pause a little more there too. All right, well, thanks for helping bring, um, you know, an, yet another perspective in on a really complicated, uh, puzzle that we're working with. You know, sometimes I think that the community interest in forests, the, one of the silver linings of all the climate change work going on is when people learn that the major source of our clean water is forests, the major source of oxygen is forests, that maybe that'll help make that um, human connection more tangible and help people become more engaged in treating them, <laughs> treating forests better, <laughs> not taking them quite so much for granted. All right. So thank you, everyone. Thank um, you very much. Appreciate yeah, the thank opportunity. You very much. Yeah, thank you. So committee, we have a short break uh, and a, a hard restart. Um, we're having a joint meeting with House uh, Natural Resources, Fish and Wildlife. We talked about it a little bit yesterday. So that we have a universal recycling law within it. There's food residuals, how they're handled and issued. This is an oversight meeting, an education meeting, a chance to have us uh, think about where we might go when we return next year. Um, the basic question is how well are we doing on, uh, on uh, solid waste implementation of the solid waste law, particularly as it relates to food residuals. And we're going to hear from some folks who think that we could do better. And there are some, uh, so it's always healthy to hear, uh, hear and learn from people who feel like we could do better. We'll also hear from the department and those who are already involved in delivering the services.
So uh, if people could be back at like 1029 so that we can jump right in because we have a pretty good witness list, we'll be moving right along in the last 90 minutes. Thank you, everyone. Oh, no one could hear me. Senator McDonald, when I was saying we're reconvening at 1029, could you hear me say that? I could hear you say that. And I looked at my my um yeah. my computer here and it says it's 1029. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've heard everything you said, Senator Bray. All right. Well, I looked I looked down after I was getting ready to turn off the video and on my computer it says muted. So I was like, oh, was I talking to myself for the last two minutes here? No. no. All right. You were not talking to yourself. All right. Well, I've been accused of that even when I'm with people. Yes. But, but my my machine says 1029. So when should we come back? In, <laughs> in, in five minutes. Okay. And we, we are still live, just so you know. Um, okay. So probably, I'm going to, let me, here it comes. Hi, Jude. Thank you for letting us in. I will let in my committee if you can let in yours. Yeah, I think they're they're here pretty much. Yeah, they should be jumping on. Yeah, they're they're pretty much here. So perfect. Thanks. Yeah. But check, check it out. Here comes Carrie Dolan. You can let her. Great. <laughs> Uh, 
All right. So good morning to people. This uh, Senator Chris Bray, we're going to start in another minute. We just finished up a section, taking a, a brief break, but scheduled to start again at ten thirty. So it's uh, great to see uh, great to see a, a, a whole room full of people, and then some. And we'll start in just a moment. Good morning, Chair Sheldon. Good morning, Chair Bray. Chair Sheldon, to say that it's a pleasure to see you is the understatement of the year. Oh. How are you? Great to see you too, Senator Kim. Yeah. Everything going well? Oh, great, of course. We sent you one of uh, Bennington County's best, Representative Bongart, so I'm sure committee has picked up significantly. Indeed, we, we appreciate that. Oh, and you have Representative Brownell. So oh my God, so it's it's double. Yeah. That's yep. great. That's great. What a cheerleader. God, I love you, brother. It's good to see you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, geez. Thank goodness McCullough's still there. <laughs> it's like uh, old town day. Yeah. All right. Great. Okay. So uh, let's get started. Um, good morning, everyone. This is a joint meeting of a House Natural Fish and Wildlife and Senate Natural Resources and Energy to um, spend a little time on Vermont's universal recycling law and how it's being implemented. Uh, and, and more particularly within the universal recycling law, the handling of food residuals. So, um, our committee yesterday spent a little time with Mr. O'Grady doing a, a primer, a reminder uh, on Vermont's universal recycling law. And for uh, anyone who's interested, if you look on our committee page under yesterday's resources, you'll find a, a really helpful um, uh, four page summary that Mr. O'Grady put together. Um, uh, and uh, so today we're we have uh, a pretty packed agenda, but I'm, I think we'll, it will work fine. We'll have to move ourselves along. Um, I talked with Chair Sheldon in advance. So what we're going to do is to ask people to hold questions until after we get through the, the groups of presenters. We'll do them in basically in groups of three or so. And that if you have a clarifying, if, you, if there's a, something that's been said that just is confusing, uh, it may well be confusing to others. So please do interrupt and we'll get a clarification and go on. But in terms of more big picture questions and discussion, sharing points of view, we'll, we'll hold that off till the, the last section of the morning. Uh, we did set aside time for Q&A and committee discussion. Um, uh, let me turn to uh, Chair Sheldon. Do you have any other uh, remarks before we, we get rolling here? No, I don't think so, but it is, it's great to be here with Senate Natural Resources. And, and um, we also did a walkthrough of an overview of the, the universal recycling law with <clears throat> Council O'Grady yesterday. So hopefully we're up to speed enough to um, follow today's testimony. Okay, well, great. Um, so uh, the 
first group of uh, folks that we'll have up <clears throat> include uh, Tom Gilbert, Deb Nair, and Jen Duggan. And um, for this group of witnesses and those that follow, um, I'm going to invite people to, uh, you know, to use it as team time. So if you want to interrupt each other and offer comments to help each other out, whatever, uh, pass the baton back and forth as you like. But meanwhile, we'll first go to um, Mr. Gilbert. Good to see you again. Thanks for coming in. And I think uh, one of the things you can really do is help us understand um, you and I have spoken in the last several weeks and you've shared some concerns. So um, if you could bring us up the committee up to speed on how we got to where we are and what you think needs to be addressed, that would be helpful to all of us. Thanks. That's great. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, good morning and thank you to uh, Chairs Bray and Sheldon and to the respective committees for for hosting us. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to take this issue up and um, and the fact that we have so many uh, committees uh, that are here as a part of this hearing, um, we feel reflects your appreciation for the seriousness of the issue. And, um, and so at the outset, I just wanted to extend my gratitude for that. Um, <clears throat> while we only have the opportunity to have a short list of witnesses, uh, hopefully folks have been able to see the, the letter that we submitted to the uh, committees in February. Um, but uh, we are speaking on behalf of a group of uh, over 25 individuals and organizations throughout Vermont uh, that are very concerned or equally concerned about uh, these issues as well. So uh, with the limited amount of time, I'll just hop right to it. Um, really, while this issue may seem very small to the unindoctrinated and those that are outside of the industry that we operate in, um, really what we're dealing with are, are central issues that will define the, the path of Vermont's organic recycling system going forward. Um, and simply said, we have, uh, we have two basic scenarios. Uh, we have a, a systems-based approach, a food systems-based approach, and we have an industrial um, laissez-faire approach. And while the two may be able to exist concurrently with one another, we do need to prioritize uh, because we can only have one priority. And I think one of the things that you'll see as we go through this is that um, core to the, the hearing this morning is about upholding the existing laws. I've been talking with some of you over the last several years, the, the most uh, frequent immediate response to somebody is, well, what, what legislation do we need? <laughs> and uh, the, the truth is, is that um, those of you that were in the chamber in 2011 and 2012, when we passed this law did excellent work and we have a law that is uh, worthy um, and simply needs to be protected. Uh, so I think Vermont should be extremely proud of its law. For those of the, you that don't have a, a view of the national environment, uh, this is considered to be one of the most progressive laws in the country. And um, at core of, to that is our source separation provisions and definitions and the, the hierarchy. So instead of backpedaling and apologizing for our ambitions, I think this is a time to stand boldly in front, um, by them and, uh, and, and protect them. Um, these new interpretations around depackaging systems, which I'll get to in a little bit, they also uh, are actively undermining uh, decades of work that Vermonters have done to build the existing system that we have, and, um, and that should not be overlooked. Fundamentally, uh, central to the URL is, is protecting resources. So at some point, I suspect you'll hear that the URL itself was designed just simply to mitigate waste from the landfill. Um, I don't think that was the sentiment of most people in the room. I believe that most people were setting out to uh, develop resource management and resource conservation legislation. And the idea of simply developing infrastructure for waste mitigation is an extremely antiquated idea. Really, it's more of an 80s or 90s idea um, <clears throat> that has already been proven out to not succeed and create all sorts of um, externalities and unintended consequences. So key to that, that resource protection is the source separation provisions, which um, are really the watershed question for everything going forward. And that's, that's the question that these committees are facing today is how important are these provisions? And did the legislature um, enact them with um, good reason? 
Source separation is best practice. It's widely known, it's an accepted industry term. And we all know what it means. It means to separate materials, compostable materials from non-compostable materials. It's as simple as that at the source. That's why we call it source separation. Um, the issue of depackaging is really just a testing question. So it's, it's secondary to the issue of source separation. So depackaging machines by nature rely on mechanical separation and not source separation. And they don't do a perfect job at that separation. And that's what we'll come back to as we talk about soil health. And many of you have been a part of very important legislation in this state around farm to plate and food systems here around working lands and emissions reduction. And I, as, you, as we go forward, I would encourage you to think about those laws and the ambitions that they represent and ask yourself if we're unwilling to prioritize soil health and protect soils from microplastics, how do we have the audacity to pursue farm to plate, working lands or emissions reductions uh, legislation? We can't take microplastics back. Um, and there's so much current research and evolving research right now in microplastics and uh, increasing awareness of how ubiquitous they are in the environment, that it's shocking that they have not been more, taken more seriously by our agency that is uh, most uh, discreetly charged with protecting the environment. Um, ultimately, the universal recycling law was also a law that that um, began to come out of a vision for Vermont's economy. And it was largely a food systems based approach. And, and the, unlike many of our surrounding states, Vermont chose to define things like source separation very, very clearly and define a hierarchy and use words like shell in our definition um, so that we could pursue that system. Uh, we learned from Act 78 that um, not directing markets and leaving uh, decision-making up to the markets never gets us where we want to get to. <clears throat> I think it's also important to realize that the decisions that these committees make on this issue is precedent setting, not just for Vermont, but also nationally. Um, there are many, many states that have been watching Vermont for the last eight years as we've pursued this path, and many now that are watching us as we start to backpedal on it including, uh, I believe, representatives uh, from around the country maybe on this call today um, observing these hearings. A little personal background just before we get into depackaging specifically. Um, I spent 13 years, I, I currently, I should say, run, uh, own and operate Black Dirt Farm here in Standard, Vermont. Um, but I spent 13 years running Highfield Center for Composting. And during that time, we developed statewide composting infrastructure around Vermont. Um, as well as developing things that are still in um, use right now by the state, like the state uh, oper compost operator certification program. And I also participated in the drafting of the URL. At Black Dirt Farm, um, we have an integrated operation. We go off of the farm, we collect discarded food from about um, 90 schools, institutions, and businesses. It's about 30 tons a week, which we bring to our own farm, as well as a couple other composting facilities. Uh, here at our farm, we blend that into a compost mix that we feed about a thousand laying hens on um, from which we ship eggs around Vermont and into the Boston market. Um, we also then make compost and worm castings from the material that they don't forage and we grow crops on the back end. Our farm has been designed to follow the carbon cycle um, and we're vertically integrated to both contain scale but also remain economically viable. Our farm might be considered a good indicator of, of the effects of decision-making at the agency level. And the fact that we are um, struggling financially, uh, COVID aside, um, since depackaging came on the scene in 2018 um, is a good indication of the effects that uh, these changes have on, on the local economy. So getting to, um, -pack, uh, to, to source separation just quickly, it's important to realize that this is a, this is a key industry term and the, the, um, the sort of uh, legal yoga that may be required to adopt the agency's um, new definition of source separation would not be considered to be um, consistent throughout the country. Source separation is how we protect our resources from uh, plastics contamination. The hierarchy is a roadmap to how we direct resources to the outcomes that we as a society want for them. Um, we learned from Act 78 that without legislative direction, 
Markets are not good decision makers. Markets cannot account for externalities and markets cannot account for things that are outside of the market. We can't expect food insecure families to compete economically with energy companies, nor can we expect local and small farmers to compete with energy companies. <clears throat> The opportunity at hand for organics recycling is great. And this is one of the reasons why the universal recycling law was passed to begin with. Vermont throws away enough food that um, is estimated if, if composted to be able to fertilize nearly 20,000 acres of mixed vegetables organically. That's somewhere between 50 and 100% of what it would take to supply vegetables to the state. Uh, if we have microplastics in that material, it would be simply criminal to be putting it on our farmland and, uh, and therefore either we choose to contaminate our soil um, or we don't put it on our farmland and we don't get the system's benefits. One of the great things about composting uh, operations and the ability to respond to something like the URL is that they're highly decentralized or they can be highly decentralized. Um, and therefore they, the benefits of them are distributed widely. They don't, they're not concentrated with one a large operator. Those include um, building soil health throughout the region, bringing nutrients, crop nutrients to those soils, and in the process, sequestering carbon, protecting water, building local jobs, and distributing dollars throughout the state. Additionally, we can mitigate greenhouse gas emissions from transportation and build intrinsic econ economies that put our communities and ecosystems first. So a little bit on how the depackaging piece works. Um, I'll just take one example. Um, so we, we used to collect from the Hannaford store in Morrisville for years. We also did price choppers and other stores that we've lost as a result of this depackaging issue. And if you think about the cookies that go on, that are on special in the front of the bakery of the Hannafords, it used to be that for a decade, the employees there would call those, they bring them to the back, they take that clamshell, they shake the cookies into our container to be used locally, and they put the plastic um, into the recycling container to be recycled. Now what happens is those cookies are never separated from the plastic, they're thrown in one bin. And um, then that material is aggregated and trucked up to Maine where it's mechanically depackaged. The result is that um, a, a certain percent, uh, the, the organic material coming out of that machine is guaranteed to have a certain percentage of plastics. It may sound low, around 1% possibly, possibly higher. But if you think about uh, the tonnages we're talking about, that's a considerable amount. Um, those materials are now lost to the Vermont food system. Those dollars are lost to the Vermont food system. And that clamshell that itself was being recycled before is no longer recyclable and is headed to incineration, um, which I thought was illegal uh, about 30 years ago. <laughs> it turns out it wasn't or isn't. Um, so ultimately what you can see is that as we, as we take um, people out of these systems and try to mechanize everything, simply the result is centralization and the downgrading of resources. So we're not evolving right now. We're not developing transcendence policy um, that could be cross-cutting and interdisciplinary in its approach. Um, we're reverting to 1980s style waste mitigation strategies that actually keep downgrading, downcycling, not upcycling the materials. Um, in 2018, when depackaging came on the scene in Vermont, um, having been circling Vermont for quite some time, uh, <clears throat> there were immediate impacts. By way of example, um, in a very short period of time, in a matter of months, we lost about 30% of our business. Vermont Compost Company, one of the, the premier composting operations in the United States and a longtime uh, composting operation in Vermont, went from 2,000 tons of food scraps a year to zero in one week. They're only now two years later back up to 150 tons per week, only because they're actually now collecting which they weren't previously. So fundamentally, um, we have to consider the, the imp implications of these things. We have to understand that if we're going to um, permit a facility to compost a thousand tons of, of organic materials coming out of a depackaging machine, 
that really means that we're composting 990 tons of food scraps and 10 tons of plastic. I'm not sure that if you submitted a permit that included 10 tons of plastic, a permit request with 10 tons of plastic on it for composting that it would be awarded. The EU has been ahead of us for decades and on these issues and they have been using depackaging machines for issues and they are having so much uh, plastic showing up in their what they call bio, bio waste compost um, that there are now calls to revert back to incineration as a safer measure so that they don't contaminate uh, food growing soils. And in a 2020 EU report, um, they cited a German study and um, and said in the EU report, avoiding contamination with plastics at its source is the most effective and efficient approach as removing plastic contamination from bio waste during treatments is both expensive and limited in its effect. Germany is now moving towards not a 1% tolerance of plastics, but a 0.1% tolerance of plastics. So looking forward, I hope that the committees um, can take the testimony that you hear this morning um, and think one first, whether they fit into the universal recycling law and uphold the, the, the integrity of that law. But two, if we decide that depackaging has a place, which it very well may, um, then I think we should take caution from what we know about microplastics um, and the importance of stewarding these resources and apply a precautionary principle as we proceed and allow for adequate science and deliberation to help guide us in um, engaging a new technology. Um, green lighting depackaging without serious consideration of its impacts will be a choice that we can never take back. We'll never remove these, these microplastics from our soil. So I hope that we can, um, I hope that we can set forward to do our best work and be as ambitious as we can and not follow in the footsteps of others simply to make their same mistakes. We shouldn't be following the same trajectory as Europe. We should be looking at the trajectory from Europe. We should be seeing where, where it's ended up and gathering lessons learned from their mistakes and leapfrogging those problems into a, uh, um, into a new future, into the 21st century. So first let's be clear about the law, let's protect the law as it is, and then let's um, utilize uh, caution as we proceed so that we can protect the precious uh, Vermont food system. Thank you for your time. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I, uh, I forgot that we were uh, going to hold on questions. Okay, Thank no you. problem. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Mr. Gilbert. I'd like to turn now to um, Dr. Nair. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have asked Marcy Gallagher to share my screen with five slides that I have. I hope she has permission to do that. Uh, for the record, my name is Deborah Deer, and I'm a professor of plant and soil science at the University of Vermont. And my scientific expertise is in soil ecology. And today I'll be, I just wanna be clear, I'll be speaking as an individual professional, not on behalf of the institution. Science is, is lagging policy. Um, current practices are driven by economics and antiquated solid waste policy without really considering environmental factors such as soil and water quality, climate change and food safety. And an investment in research is really necessary to ensure that our data-driven policy, our policies are data-driven and that we can avoid unintended consequences. So scientists I seek to make uh, data to make decisions like where are data to support statements that source separation won't work? Uh, work for who? So with this slide, I say, as a systems thinker, I think about connections among different perspectives and the consequences of if we discount source separation. For example, without source separation, we diminish the quality and uses of the end product, making them no longer suitable for application to our land that's producing our food. They add risks and costs downstream. And they also generate psychological distance between people and their role in production, reuse, and recycling. Next slide. Microplastics uh, result, yeah, result from the splintering and fragmenting of plastics into small bits that do not decompose. Uh, these microscopic sized particles do not weigh very much and they accumulate in volume and surface area. They get mistaken as food. Uh, by organisms, microplastics are consumed and they bioaccumulate in the food chain, including our own food supply. These effects uh, 
are well documented in aquatic food chains and all evidences suggest that the same patterns are occurring in soil. Given my expertise in soil ecology, I'll focus on the science related to soil as a resource to provide our own food supply. Next slide. The empirical evidence is mounting of detrimental impacts of microplastics in soil food webs. It only took me five minutes to find over 35 references about the effects on soil quality and none of these tout any neutral or beneficial effects. They all suggest we proceed with caution. Some examples of detrimental effects are on this slide. Uh, one, we see that uh, plastics tend to decrease the nutritional quality of our fruits and vegetables. These inert fragments are so small that they're in soil in water, soil water and they're taken up by plants through natural processes and end up in the edible parts of fruits and vegetables. Carrots and apples, for example, have been found to be the worst cases found to date. And plastics can also act as a source and a carrier of agrochemicals to soil organisms such as earthworms. They've been found to impair soil function. The microfibers can be incorporated into soil aggregates, but they introduce these fracturing points. So the aggregates are no longer stable and able to reduce, and they end up reducing the water holding capacity of soil. And the consequence is it diminishes the resiliency of plants to drought that we might expect with climate change. They also have bioaccumulated in the food web, um, been found to changing the behavior of organisms in soil, including earthworms. The hypothesized mechanism is that it's affecting uh, basically the hormonal or the endocrine system equivalent of these soil invertebrates. There's also climate change uh, connections. Next slide, please. The plastics are polymers of carbon and carbon storage in soil is promoted to mitigate climate change. However, our most common method to determine organic matter cannot distinguish between plastic and organic matter. And therefore we end up overestimating our soil carbon storage. Large economic investments tend to favor really highly centralized networks that require long distances of hauling that burn fossil fuels. Life cycle analysis has not been performed to determine net environmental impacts of diversion versus greenhouse gas emissions. Life cycle analysis could help define the optimal spatial distribution of hauling networks in organics handling facilities. So in conclusion, on my next slide, there's good reasons, good scientific reasons for policies associated with the hierarchy and source separation that relate to our health and environment. And these effective solutions require a systems perspective. Let's use our current science to inform and advance our environmental agenda rather than rely on paradigms of the past. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And with uh... Any clarifying questions? Okay, seeing none, I'll move on to um, Jen Duggan, Ms. Duggan, good morning. Thank you for coming back to join us in the committee. Good morning, uh, Chair Spray and Chair Sheldon and members of the committee. And, and thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony this morning. The prior witnesses have provided some really important context and background around the passage of the universal recycling law and the intent and ambition of the organics management provisions. And you've also heard about the serious economic, public health and environmental impacts and the shift towards an industrial food recycling system that are the result of ANR's interpretation and implementation of the organic management provisions. And so I wanna use my limited time this morning to focus on the legal interpretation of two of the most important provisions, the food residuals management hierarchy and source separation provisions. And although we are not in court today, I do think it's really helpful to take a step back and think about how a court would evaluate ANR's interpretation of the law you're hearing different interpretations from folks. And I think it's really important to make sure that we're grounding that conversation within a legal framework. To start, because ANR is not interpreting the provisions of the statute through a formal rulemaking process, a court would afford the agency some level of deference, but it would be limited. 
And there's a really good reason for this. In this situation, the agency hasn't vetted these interpretations through a formal rulemaking process, which means that the agency would be, you know, if they were to go through this process, they would be required to put forth a robust rationale. Um, members of the public would have an opportunity to provide comment. The agency would be required to respond to them. And then the interpretation would be reviewed by ICAR and LCAR. That's not happened here. And so the level of deference a court would give would be limited. Where an agency has gone through a formal rulemaking proceeding, a court would apply a much more deferential standard. But courts will only defer if the statute is silent or ambiguous and the agency's interpretation is reasonable. And no matter what, courts must reject interpretations that are contrary to the intent of the legislature. And if the language of the statute is clear and it's unambiguous, the court must give effect to the intent of the legislature. And when interpreting a statute, a court must follow the plain meaning of the statute and it has to read each provision by reference to the whole statute. For example, a court can't interpret a provision in a way that would render another provision meaningless um, or in a way that would be inconsistent with the policy of another provision in that statute. And so it really is looking at these provisions in the context of the whole um, and in the intent of the, of the legislature. And so with that legal framework in mind, I want to talk first about the food residuals management hierarchy. To start, the plain language of the statute is clear, it's specific, and it includes the term shall. It says it's the policy of the state that food residuals collected under the requirements of this chapter shall be managed according to the following order of priority uses, and it lists those five specific uses. And although you may hear that this is just a non-binding policy statement, the language in this provision is distinct from the kinds of vague and general statements of policy that courts have found to be non-binding. In fact, it's really similar to um, a provision in the groundwater protection statute that provides the state with the ability to take legal action for impacts to groundwater. So 10 VSA 1390, Provision 5, that's the groundwater protection statute, it states it's the policy of the state that the groundwater resources of the state are held in trust for the public. This is similar to the specific clear mandatory language that's found in Act 148. A few other comments on this provision. You know, I just want to, you know, underscore that the goal of the organics management provisions of Act 148 is not simply to keep food waste out of the landfill. It also includes goals of resource protection and management. Otherwise, the legislature would not have gone through the trouble to include express language that food residuals shall be managed according to this management hierarchy. The management hierarchy is also not a menu of options to pick and choose from. Subsection A states that food residuals shall be managed according to the following order of priority uses. The title of the section includes the term hierarchy. And the term hierarchy means a system of things ranked one above another. This term does not mean a list of things to choose from. Finally, an agency can't abdicate its obligation to promote and enforce the laws established by the legislature because the law may be difficult to enforce. The agency can promulgate rules or issue guidance related to enforcement. It could come back to the legislature to seek a change or additional guidance. But as far as I'm aware, the agency has not done any of these things um, and they can't simply see you know, their obligation to um, enforce the laws that the legislature um, establishes. I also wanna talk about source separation because as Mr. Gilbert noted, this is really how we protect resources. It's critical to implementing the food recycling system that the legislature envisioned when it passed the law. 
which is a system that supports um, a community-based food system and not industrial technology that contaminates our soils with microplastics and is downgrading valuable organic resources. So under these provisions, generators are required to separate food residuals from other solid waste and source separation means the separation of compostable and recyclable materials from non-compostable, non-recyclable materials at the point of generation, and that's key. And the definition of food residuals includes this term as well. So if we use Mr. Gilbert's example, the grocery store is required to remove those cookies from a plastic clamshell container and separate the cookies and the packaging at the grocery store. This is important and it makes sense when these provisions are read together with the management hierarchy. The inclusion of the hierarchy in combination with these source separation provisions is to make sure that our organic waste is diverted to the highest and best uses before it's used for things like energy recovery. And in order to accomplish this, you need an uncontaminated stream of material, which is where source separation comes into play. And you've heard from both witnesses that the depackaging technology that's used when materials are not source separated at the point of generation leads to contamination of both our soils with microplastics and also our recyclables with food residue. So this interpretation is also consistent with common understanding in the compost industry, as Mr. Gilbert pointed out, which is something that courts look at when interpreting statutes. If a term is used and widely understood to mean one thing, that is given weight. Um, and in neighbor states considering similar issues, industrial operations, they're advocating for specific provisions that expressly remove the generator source separation requirement. There would be no reason to seek out these exemptions under ANR's interpretation of source separation. So just to you know, pull it all together, the interpretation that generators are required to separate food from packaging materials at the point of generation, it's consistent with the plain language of the statute, it's consistent with the statute as a whole, it's consistent with legislative intent, and it's consistent with industry understanding of the term. The agency hasn't provided any explanation as to how the use of the packaging technology is consistent with that requirement to separate at the source at the point of generation. And instead, we're hearing other interpretations like food can remain in packaging as long as the food in packaging is separated from the trash, or there's no requirement to separate at the store if food remains in packaging that's recyclable. But these interpretations are not consistent with the language of the statute, the statute as a whole or legislative intent or how the industry uses these terms. So I'll stop there because I know our time is limited, but I, I wanna underscore that not only are the interpretations of the agency inconsistent with the statute and legislative intent, they have real world and adverse consequences for compost operators, for our food system, for public health and the environment. And there is a lot at stake, but the law to protect these important resources and build strong community-based food systems is already written. You already passed it. It's already on the books. We just need to enforce it. I really appreciate all of the time um, that the two committees are devoting to this issue. And I look forward to your questions. Okay. So for the moment, any clarifying questions of Ms. Duggan? All right, uh, Senator Campion. Yeah, uh, thanks Ms. Duggan. So this is a, you would frame this as an enforcement issue at this point. I would note that there are two issues at play. I think that we would point out that the interpretations by the agency are not consistent with the statute. And so because those, there, you know, we don't agree with the interpretation of the statute, the actions of the agency in terms of implementation and enforcement flow from that. Does that make sense, Senator Kim? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, and I'll just ask one very quick follow-on to that question then. 
because you were general counsel at ANR, so you've been on the other side of the street. Uh, what is, uh, in terms of an option for how this might be addressed from the legislature's perspective, um, how might we say we have a concern with that interpretation and how would you as, how would the legislature then engage a &R based on your past experience? Would we, for instance, require a rulemaking? So I think that, you know, the legislature plays a critical oversight role to ensure that the executive branch is um, implementing and enforcing the statutes that you pass, the policies that you, that you put in place. So I think by holding this hearing um, is, is critical, communicating the concerns that you have to the agency um, in a formal way um, is also important. If you believe that the agency is not interpreting the law or implementing the law consistent with the statute, formalizing that um, in a letter is important. The agency already has rulemaking authority to, um, you know, to promulgate rules to implement the statute. Um, and so, um, you know, the, you, there's, as, as, you know, as, as Mr. Gilbert noted, and I noted the law is already on the books, they just have to actually implement it. And so I think expressing that formal concern about the interpretation of the law and directing them to address it um, would be, important. Okay. All right. Well, well thanks. thanks. Mr. Chair, may I ask one clarifying question also uh, of you. So is there, I, I see that Secretary Moore is really where the buck stops on this, if it's not the governor himself. Uh, and I know we're not hearing from Secretary Moore today. Um, I sus is it accurate to say that Ms. Jamison is representing the administration's position on this? Well, she's our next witness, so we can ask her that. But yeah, we did we did ask uh, Ms. Jamison in to speak on behalf of the division and the agency. And so remember the administration, I'm guessing this is a, an administration view, but we can get that explicit. So with that, we'll continue the uh, to move forward. I'd like to next call on uh, Ms. Jamison uh, to, uh, talk, uh, uh, I, I would say, since we've uh, spoken with you in the past uh, at some length about various aspects of it, um, not trying to put you in the hot seat in any way, but to, because we have limited time, if you could uh, speak about the two issues that are really coming front and center on, on how the program regards uh, food wastes, and maybe if you have some comments around uh, source separation and the notion of a hierarchy, those seem to keep re-emerging as issues uh, that people are interested in interpreting and getting clarity on. Yes, thank you. And for the record, I'm Kathy Jamison, Solid Waste Program Manager at the Agency of Natural Resources. And with me today is, is uh, Chuck Schwer as well. Uh, we have uh, discussed this issue with uh, Commissioner Walk and Secretary Moore. And what we're about to share is um, uh, a, a position that they concur with. Um, so just, um, I would like to touch on um, the issues that are being raised, um, the hierarchy, source separation and contamination um, and all with respect to universal recycling law. And remember that um, you know, that, that was a law uh, passed in 2012 and, and the goal was of that law because um, I was um, very much a part of um, the, the development drafting an implementation of that law, it, 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 the main goal was to divert materials from disposal. And we, of course, want to divert them in a very responsible uh, 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 manner. Um, with that, um, as you all know, uh, we had the disposal ban take effect in July 1, 2020, which means we have a lot of food waste that needs to be managed throughout the state. And as part of that food waste, we have about 80 thousand tons of food waste that's being disposed by Vermonters. And through our waste composition study, which is a statistically sound study, we found that 30,000 of those 80,000 tons, so that's 38% of the food we throw away 
is in packaging. So we need to deal with food waste and packaging if we want to divert those materials. And with respect to food waste, one of the most important aspects of not only saving landfill capacity when we divert that is also um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions because when food waste goes to the landfill, it can generate methane, which is a more potent greenhouse gas um, than carbon dioxide, as you all know. Um, and so yeah, jumping into the hierarchy, and with respect to both the hierarchy and the, and the source separation issues, I would encourage folks that haven't seen or heard Mike O'Grady's discussion with the Senate Natural Resources Committee yesterday to, to view that, um, because I think he has maybe a different view of that than maybe that that was just shared with Jen Duggan. Um, but with that, um, the hierarchy that's in the law um, is a policy statement, and we think of it as the three R's. So we also have in statute um, the three R's, which we've had for a long time, reduce, reuse, recycling. And in implementation of that, we don't require the generators of waste to maximize reduction before they can reuse it or before it can even be recycled. Uh, so, so we do promote all, all use of those options, um, even though we understand there's a better benefit, much better benefit from reduction than there would be recycling. We don't say you can't recycle until you've maximized reduction. And so likewise, with the hierarchy for managing organics, um, we don't say you have to, it's not a mandate to maximize one of the preferences before you go on to another. Um, in fact, um, there are organizations, generators, large retail grocery stores that are using more than one of those preferences in the hierarchy simultaneously. Um, and, and think about it from the law's perspective. The hierarchy is a mandate on the generator. And actually everyone in Vermont's a generator of food waste. But in particular, think about it um, from the businesses. So how would a business, let's say a, a restaurant, um, know that they need, how would they know that they have maximized any option on one before they move on to the other? That would be pretty hard for a restaurant to know, have I maximized sending food waste to farms? Um, how far would they have to go? before they send it to the compost facility. We've not implemented uh, the hierarchy in this manner, and I don't think it would be possible to implement it in that manner. I, don't, I think it would be unattainable for the generator who is responsible for managing the material in accordance with a hierarchy. I also don't think it would be enforceable for a &R to determine, did that restaurant maximize one of the preferences before they moved on to the other? Um, so, so we do use and promote the options. We understand the benefit of using one option more than the other, um, but we allow the use of all of those preferences in the hierarchy. And there's a, a diversity of options. And I think it's healthy for Vermont to be using multiple different options. You know, it's a, pardon the pun, but you don't want all your eggs in one basket. You, you know, I think we need to have different options. Um, and, and I think the marketplace, you know, it's evolving, it's sorting that out. Um, and I think there's enough organics, we got 80,000 tons of it. I think there's enough organics to go around. Um, and, and there's a need to process these food scraps throughout the state. Um, moving on to source separation as I understand we have a limited time. Um, I think it would be really good to hear from the generators and to visit facilities to see what is actually happening on the ground. Um, the law requires that the food residuals be separated out from the trash. We are requiring that. All the generators have to separate it out from the trash. Um, what, what we're hearing is that they want further separation from the packaging. And again, um, the use of depackaging equipment um, is going to be an important tool to get at that 38,000 tons of, of food that's in packaging. 
Um, and it would be, you know, if to follow what the, 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 the folks are advocating for is that every grocery store would have to have their own equipment on site to do that, to follow what they're saying is at the point of separation. That, that would not be practical. Uh, some of this equipment is very expensive and it makes sense to have it centralized. Um, so we are gonna depend on the use of depackaging. Um, there is plenty of food waste out there and there's going to be those food waste generators that are wanting to do that source separating themselves because that will give them a less costly option. If they do that work up front, they can use a less costly option. They're not gonna to wanna to pay the amount it would take to um, manage it through the more uh, uh, costly um, uh, use of the equipment from depackaging. So that the other hierarchy preferences are gonna to continue to be used. Um, DEC will continue to work with generators um, on, on promoting the various uh, preferences in the hierarchy. Um, and um, the contamination issue is, is a real issue. It is an issue and a challenge whether one is composting or separating it out to go to an anaerobic digestion. And just to be clear, even if food waste is perfectly source separated out, for it to be managed through an anaerobic digestion, which is a very valuable option to have because that helps provide us renewable energy. Um, it has to be processed, that food waste has to be processed so it's pumpable. And the equipment that can be used to do that is depackaging. So depackaging can be used whether or not the food is in packaging or not in packaging to, to allow that food waste to go to anaerobic digestion. Um, but we are concerned about the amount of material going to both composting facilities and anaerobic digestion um, that could eventually end up on the soils. Uh, it is an issue that is evolving and that we need to um, learn more about. I think you're going to hear from others that are involved with anaerobic digestion and how they're screening that material to try to reduce any of those um, items getting into the waste stream up front. And we're also looking at how other states are managing this. Are they coming up with standards? You know, California has a standard, not necessarily because of the microplastics, but they don't want waste being inadvertently or purposely going through their organic stream um, in order to achieve their waste reduction goal. And I, we are looking at what other states are doing. And I think it's important to continue to do that. But in the meantime, we need to continue to maximize our food waste reduction, our, our, our diversion from the landfill, and to maximize trying to reduce greenhouse gases while we work on these evolving technologies and reducing contamination. So with that. Okay. Thank you questions? very much. Okay, seeing and hearing none. Thank you very much, Ms. Jamison. Um, Thank you. Keep us marching right along. Uh, next up is uh, Ms. Crosby. Mr. Chair, just so you know, Mr. Uh, Representative McCullough has his hand up. Okay, I missed that. Uh, Representative McCullough. It was a late hand. Thank you. Um, uh, Kathy, you mentioned the concerns around composting and, 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 and anaerobic digestion. Did that include the incineration options also as a clarifying question? Okay, so to be clear, food waste is not being incinerated. Um, anaerobic digestion is not incineration. Um, so that facility in Maine that's receiving food waste is an anaerobic digester, just like we have in Vermont. And I should have mentioned, um, and I meant to, that we, we have investments being made in anaerobic digestion, which I think is a real positive thing in Vermont for managing food scraps as a new one in, uh, in Salisbury. And we have application for three more elsewhere in Vermont. And that's gonna help us achieve having capacity for managing food scraps, um, but it's not incineration. Thank you. Uh, Senator McCormick, clarifying question. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just touching, this is fundamental. I should have asked it at the beginning of the hearing. Are there people depositing food wastes in plastic containers in the uh, compost facilities? I mean, I don't understand how plastic gets in there in the first place. I would think you would dump the, the compost out of the plastic container into the, uh, the receptacle. So I don't know who, who I'm asking. Okay. Um, so with respect uh, to composting, there's um, different facilities allow different types of materials to be processed at their facilities. So there are some that will say absolutely no, nothing other than food that could actually go in your mouth, basically, um, is kind of how we think of that. Um, there are others that will take um, the, the compostable utensils, that will take compostable bags, they may even even take milk cartons the you know the um, not the plastic ones but the the ones that have the cardboard um, in them um, that can break down in the composting uh, process and so there are different facilities in Vermont that allow different types of um, materials to be composted some will take um, you know um, uh, paper type products because that's a carbon source uh, while others will not um, and so we can and, and with that, though, I, I do want to say July 1, 2020, we implemented the ban statewide, which is a positive thing. Um, I think we are getting more mistakes now of what can and cannot go into your compost bin or, or bucket that goes to a facility. And, and ANR needs to continue to work uh, with outreach on, on trying to help better educate people on what is appropriate and not appropriate. But I think if you ask facilities, they are seeing an uptick in things that should not be going to their uh, composting facility um, over the last year. Okay, thank you. That's all I know. Right. Um, I did wanna ask one very quick clarifying question. So I know that you were saying at the facility over in Maine that is depackaging food, the food isn't being incinerated but the packaging that's separated from the food is being incinerated. Is that, is that the connection? I think sometimes it's confusing people. That yes, yes. Um, Maine does have an, an incinerator that would be used like disposal for us. Um, that packaged food, um, think about it. Uh, before, mm, much of that, the majority of that had been being landfilled, uh, packaging and all. Uh, with the um, use of depackaging, and I, and I think you'll hear from others regarding this, they can capture some of that packaging. Um, we had a staff person go up to the new depackaging facility up in Williston, and there were a lot of aluminum containers um, uh, that going through the system, and there was a, a nice clean bale of aluminum that came out of the depackaging. You know, the, the material that was in there, the food, the, the lit, actually it was drink, the beverage went to the, a digester and the aluminum went on the market to make new aluminum cans. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so I guess we'll just flag it. Although the incineration is happening out of state, if we're part of the system that feeds that yep. incinerator, then we should acknowledge our role in it. Um, mm -hmm. With that, I'd like to turn to Ms. Crosby. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good morning. Senator Bray, could I just ask a clarifying question? Yes, please. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Ms. Jamison, I'm sorry if I missed this, but when Mr. Gilbert started his presentation, he talked about the situation at a Hannaford's where somebody goes in or, or where uh, staff in the evenings uh, goes through and discards things that have passed, et cetera. In the state of Vermont right now, is Hannaford's uh, legally able to toss cookies and things in their packaging into, into some kind of compost process, if you will? Right. Um, we believe Hannaford's is compliant with the law. They right. are so the, the, law would say, the law would tell them they, they, they are not being, it's against the law to do that. Right, where would you draw the line? Um, they are sorting out their trash, they're sorting out the recyclables, they're sorting out food that's edible for food rescue. Ask the Vermont Food Bank, they will confirm um, that Hannaford's as well as other large retailers are doing that. And so, then so I'm sorry, I'm not being clear. There, there are a dozen cookies 
that have gone bad and they're in a plastic package, do they have to remove the cookies from the package before they throw them away? No, we, we okay, believe- that's part of the problem, okay. We, well, I would say they're not throwing it away. They're putting it in a bin that then gets further processed off site to separate out the packaging from the cookies and then the cookies get processed in an anaerobic digester and the packaging comes out and gets managed differently. Okay, you can return to this. But I, I, think, I think what would be helpful is for folks to understand more of what happens at a depackaging facility. Perhaps, thank you. All right, well. When, Is that my cue? <laughs> yes, I think that could be a cue for you, Ms. Crosby. Thanks. Um, so good morning, for the record, Kim Crosby, um, Environmental Compliance Manager with Casella. Um, so with the final phase of the organic span um, coming into place, uh, we recognize that there was a large portion of the organic waste stream that isn't being source separated or isn't source separated at the point of generation. Um, and prior to July 1st, that material was going to the landfill for disposal. And then after July 1st, with the statewide organic span in full effect, disposal was not um, going to be an option for, for those um, customers anymore. So without an in-state depackaging facility, this material would have to be hauled to an out-of-state depackaging facility to be separated. Um, there are many food manufacturers that are our customers, and we needed an option for managing their off-specification products in lieu of disposal. So recognizing that need, Casella began permitting and constructing a depackaging operation adjacent to our transfer station in Williston. Um, we received our final permit from the Department of Environmental Conservation in February of 21. So we're still in the real early trial and error phase of operating this facility. Um, we're trying to figure out the best way to process the various types of materials that we are accepting. Um, I think it's gonna take a good year to figure out some of the, the best management practices, especially as we go through some seasonal changes. Um, we're currently working with a UVM graduate student who is working on quantifying microplastic contamination for different food slurries that are being produced by the depackaging unit. Um, the research that is being done will help us determine best practices for depackaging and generate key information for digestion facilities that can receive depackaged food waste slurries. Um, I do have a brief PowerPoint presentation that includes some photos and pictures of the types of materials that we can process. Um, share my screen here if it works. Can you see my screen? Uh, not quite yet. Hmm. You noticed that was an optimistic report. Not <laughs> quite yet. We know what's going to happen. Uh, let's see. Does she have to be? That? And here we go. Okay, good. Let's go from the beginning. How about, are we good? Yes. Okay. So just an overview of our facility. Um, we have a tip floor and bunkers for organic material storage as the material comes in and is tipped and offloaded. We can store it in bunkers prior to it being uh, loaded into the hopper that feeds the depackaging unit. Um, the type of unit we chose was a, a top of the line uh, Scott Turbo Thor, which can process 20 tons per hour. So in an eight hour shift, 160 tons. Um, we have three really large 15,000 gallon tanks um, of organic slurry capacity. Um, and our, our liquid slurry goes to um, currently three digesters for co-generation. We're taking it to one in South Burlington, um, the one in Salisbury, and a wastewater treatment plant digester in Essex. Um, and we can also process organic solids through the unit for uh, additional composting or animal feed. Um, we installed a, a baler to recycle the cardboard from the material that we are getting in that was formerly being landfilled. So now we're capturing that material for recycling. And as Kathy did mention, um, we do get a lot of off specification alcohol products and side hard cider products um, that 
need to be separated from the cans. And once we do that, we are bailing the cans and recycling them. Again, prior to the installation of this unit, that material was being landfilled. And like I said, we received our operating permit at the end of um, February in 21. Just a um, overview of the site plan. It's kind of difficult to get your bearings if you've never been to the site, which we, we would like to have both committees um, come out and see the place, hopefully once COVID-19 restrictions lift a little bit. Um, but there, there's the tipping area in the lower right-hand corner. Um, right above the two tipping areas, you'll see a little rectangular um, object. That's the hopper, that's the infeed. That's where the material gets loaded into and it feeds into the depackaging unit, which is connected to that hopper. And this is what the actual unit looks like itself. Um, this is when it was being installed. Um, there's inside the, the shaft of this unit, there's several um, paddles inside and that's what help, that's what wax the, <laughs> the packaging out of the liquids or the solids from the packaging and helps it separate it out. Um, below the paddles, there's a series of screens. So essentially the organic material falls through the screens and the packaging material stays on top of those screens. And you can, you can change the screens, the sizes of the screens out depending on the type of material that you're processing. So there's large screens and then there's a smaller screen depending upon what you're getting in. So here's a, a general view of the types of material that we're running through this piece of equipment. Um, a lot of Ben and Jerry's, um, this, was Ben and Jerry's was going to a waste incineration plant prior to coming to our facility. Um, on the right hand side is expired baby formula. Um, so I can't I can't imagine some a generator spending the time to empty each one of these containers um, out into a out into another container to be composted. Um, the lower left hand corner is an example of some curbside collection, commercial curbside collection organics material that we collected. And you can see there's quite a bit of, of plastic um, in that material that needs to be separated. And here's how we're getting some of the other materials. So a lot of off-spec product, um, there is some labor uh, involved on our part. We have to unwrap the plastic. We have to take the um, material out of the cardboard boxes. Again, we're recycling what we can. We're not uh, sending any packaging that can be recycled to incineration. And so I mentioned earlier, the, the organic material falls out onto the screen and it goes up a, a chute and empties out into a designated roll-off container. You can see the uh, yellow powdery material, that's the baby formula. And then beyond that is the garbage that comes out from another chute from below the screens. And the one on the right is the organic material uh, from the curbside compost uh, route that we process through the unit. It's a picture of the slurry tanks. And that's really all there is to it. Um, again, you know, we were hoping to have a grand opening at some point, it's kind of been delayed. Um, with, with COVID, but we would like to have everybody come out and see it in person at some point, hopefully this summer. Great. Well, uh, I think we're all hoping for a, to be able to yeah. do a lot more things this summer <laughs> and a field trip would be helpful. Um, but yes. meanwhile, thank you for bringing those pictures because it does make it a lot easier for us to see things rather than just have to imagine them. Yep. Um, I'm mindful Agreed. of the clock. I don't see any questions, but I can't see everyone very well. So if there's a question, please holler out. All right. And with that, then, uh, thank you, Ms. Crosby. We'll go to um, Lisa Ransom's with us. Good morning, Ms. Ransom. Good morning. Good to um, see you again. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. Um, my name, again, is Lisa Ransom. I own grow compost of Vermont with my husband, Scott Boffman. Our business was formed about 12 years ago to capture 
and protect the valuable resources of organics to reduce methane and to help build soils um, in Vermont. We collect and haul food scraps and agricultural organics to make um, compost and soil. Last year, our trucks hauled over 7 million pounds of food scraps from Vermont businesses, resorts, schools, prisons, office buildings, and residents. Diverting this material from the landfill to agricultural uses for chicken foraging, compost, for bedding, and for clean energy. Uh, Grow Compost runs a double stream of organic collection, one stream that collects food scraps for the creation of compost for Vermont soils, and a separate stream that is diverted to DPAC and anaerobic digesters. Scott and I and our incredible Grow Compost team of truck drivers and soil builders feel as if we are making a difference. As the United Nation warns that the earth continues to somersault toward irreversible climate change consequences, Vermont is making a difference. Currently, as Kathy mentioned, Vermont diverts over 80,000 tons of food scraps from the state's single landfill and puts these resources back into agricultural uses. A New York Times article published just this week reported that reducing emissions of methane will be critical to reaching goals for reducing climate change. The article discusses that the reason reducing methane has gained prominence in this global conversation is because cutting methane concentrations is the quickest way to slow rising global temperatures. And as you know, methane emissions stem primarily from three sectors, fossil fuels, landfill, and agriculture. Vermont is a leader in the country for our progressive and successful diversion of organic material from landfill through our universal recycling law. Our position is that we need diversion on every level. Organic collection for chickens to forage, hauling food scraps to make compost for our Vermont farmers, collecting organic material to be used to create energy through anaerobic digestion. As the economy reopens, Vermont is poised to be stronger and more resilient. The future of green business in Vermont is bright. Our compost law is encouraging resilience and local food production. Vermonters are building gardens, creating small compost collection startup businesses, building new anaerobic digesters, such as the one now located on the Goodrich Farm in Salisbury. And I see um, that John Hanselman is here to speak as well. So I look forward to that. It will take all of this effort to reach our goals for diverting food scraps across the state. I believe the resiliency of Vermont is directly related to the universal recycling law and Vermonters engagement with these resources in their own homes, in their businesses, at the grocery store where they buy their food, at the office spaces and schools where they spend their days, at the parks in which they re recreate. All of these businesses before you, both large and small compost operators, haulers, anaerobic digesters, they all play a critical part in meeting the needs of regional businesses, food manufacturers, breweries, convenience stores, prisons, schools, universities, hospitals, and individuals throughout the state. These efforts are crucial to survival on this planet, to the growth of our green economy and to the clean oil, air, soil and water in Vermont. Reducing greenhouse gases and building soil in Vermont requires that we continue using all of these resources and work collaboratively in order to offer Vermonters every opportunity to engage in this important work through something they all do every day, eat. I so appreciate your attention to this issue and I'm um, happy to answer questions. Uh, Senator Campion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the testimony very much. Uh, it's, you know, what I'm sitting here thinking we need to do more and more is put pressure on those people, those manufacturers that are sending the plastics to us in the first place. And in other words, you know, how do we get them to say, you know, and we're not California, we're not a huge state that has that kind of, you know, economic influence, but we have to get to the point where we say, you know, we are just not going to accept things wrapped in plastics, and we are going to we are going to accept things that have are more compostable, easier. You know, more well, more than just acceptable 
acceptable to be composted and then spread. It has to be, uh, we need to rethink that. And I'm not sure how to put that pressure there. Part of it I, is I do think we say to the grocery stores and, and everyone along the way, you need to separate this so that the grocery stores that do have some economic force, they can then go and uh, force the manufacturers or put pressure on the manufacturers to behave the way that they need to behave in this. So um, I'll just leave it at that, but I appreciate uh, Ms. Ramson's uh, testimony and, and her commitment to, to what is, uh, could again lead to unhealthy drinking water, unhealthy foods. It's this constant poisoning of ourselves and the future generations of, of, of humanity. So if I could just say, I just respond with a couple quick things. One is that we, no one wants plastic. Nobody wants that in our, it's expensive. It's, you know, it's, it's horrible for the environment. We can't put it in our soil um, compositions. Um, and so nobody wants that. And one, uh, the other dynamic that we're finding is that these larger grocery stores have brokers that are nationwide, right? And so like Hannaford's, for instance, isn't just your local Vermont Han Hannaford stores anymore. Right. You can't even talk to the manager of that Hannaford store. And it's not even someone located in Vermont, right? So it's a, it's a, you know, regional um, or even national broker. So it is, that is the pressure. And because we run that dual stream, we, we charge almost double to carry, you know, to, for that DPAC stream as we do for the clean stream. So that's one little way that we feel that we can make, we can make a difference. Sure. Nothing's going to happen unless we regulate. I mean, history shows unless we regulate, unless we make these major changes, we're just going to continue down this road. Thank okay. you. Um, so just as a reminder, we were working. We sort of got knocked off track by COVID, and there's still work going on in the background on extended producer responsibility around packaging. And so it's a good point. And it, you know, I think that everyone in this, both committees knows the best cure is going as far upstream on the problem as you can, as opposed to mitigating downstream. Um, but I do wanna make sure we have time to turn to Mr. Hanselman, who is, uh, we haven't, I don't think you've been in our committees before, or at least not the Senate side. Um, so welcome to uh, today's hearing and love to hear about your take on this system we're talking about. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bray and, and committee members. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak on this incredibly important topic and all the important strides that I think we're making in Vermont uh, to move the, the problem forward. Um, my name is John Hanselman. I'm founder and chief executive officer of Vanguard Renewables. Uh, Vanguard Renewables is the owner and operator of the Goodrich Farm Anaerobic Digester uh, in Salisbury, Vermont. And it's the newest addition to Vermont's historic leadership in agricultural renewable energy production. Um, at Vanguard Renewables, uh, we're committed to immediate actions that can make progress against the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and slowing uh, the rate of climate change. As Lisa said a minute ago, uh, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has noted that if, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world behind China and the United States. Uh, if there's any chance of, of reaching the, the climate goals agreed to in, in Paris, we must dramatically reduce the amount of short-lived climate pollutants, uh, the SLCPs, uh, that are so duly noted in all of the proceedings. Um, methane, uh, which is produced from the breakdown of food waste, is the most destructive SLCP, being 40 times more corrosive than CO2, as, as Lisa also noted. Um, we are honored to be part of, of the Vermont renewables community and recycling community. We see Act 148 in the URL is one of the most important set of laws in the United States as it recognizes the role uh, that organic waste plays in generating these SLCPs. Um, Vermont has gone further than any other state in encouraging food waste recycling and the public-private partnership that Vanguard and others have built um, in-state is due to these progressive public policies. It's a strong and functioning example, I think, to the rest of the nation as to how we can immediately attack these terrible stationary emitter uh, sources and also to start to lead the charge on dealing with the other issues of microplastics and other issues that come up with the recycling of food waste. Um, because of, of Act 148 and, and the, the policies of Vermont, 
Megarbenables felt comfortable building um, this digester in Salisbury. Uh, the digester was built to create a new model, um, even for us, and recycling organic materials in the US. Uh, we built a closed loop system there to take both commercial and residential food waste and recycle it into carbon negative renewable natural gas for Vermont residents and businesses, and then to return those food nutrients back to the soil, um, but after they've been mechanically processed so that we can actually reduce the phosphorus and reduce the, the carbon commitment and return that fertilizer back to our farm hosts. Uh, we believe that this is probably the first in the nation where this much care has been taken on the downstream product. And we think it is the model that we'd like to see um, across the US. Um, to be specific about Salisbury, uh, we take 100% of the manure from the farm. Um, that's over a thousand cows worth of, of manure. And we source our food waste from local food manufacturers and generators uh, like Cabot, uh, Agrimark, uh, Ben & Jerry's, Alchemist Brewery, and, and many, many more local food manufacturers and institutions. Um, we then heat that, that slurry. Uh, we cook it, if, if you will, uh, like in a uh, million gallon Instapot, um, set the timer for 30 days and temperature for about 104 degrees. And then we let the naturally occurring uh, microorganisms from the cow's gut break down the organic material, um, emit the methane. We then capture that methane, um, clean it, send it through the natural gas pipeline uh, to Middlebury College and then to the retail customers of uh, Vermont Gas Services to decarbonize uh, their thermal footprint. That one single digester is the equivalent of removing almost 5,000 homes from their current fossil uh, fuel source. Once that methane has been removed from the organics, uh, we mechanically, we take that liquid, the, the post-processed slurry, um, and we remove the phosphorus, we move plastics, we screen it and uh, actually use a dissolved air flotation system um, to remove both of those critically important pieces out of that. We would then return that, that digestate liquid um, as low phosphorus, low carbon fertilizer back to the farm. Um, this closed-up system has the direct impact of removing all of that atmospheric uh, methane creating renewable energy to uh, reduce our reliance on fossil fuel and improving the sustainability of the farm in the Otter Creek watershed and the resulting uh, Lake Champlain uh, sustainability. What all digesters wanna do is encourage not just large sources of organics, but also residential restaurants and institutions to recycle their food waste. What every digester in Vermont cannot do currently is recycle package or bags organics at the farm. The consistent safe operation of our digesters and the farm requires that mechanical separation of the organic matter from its packaging prior off to the farm. Mechanical separation or depackaging that we've been talking about, um, it's expensive and complicated, but it's something that has been ongoing in Europe and the UK for, for decades now. Uh, we at Vanguard Renewables actually operate our own depackaging facility in Massachusetts, and it is radically increased the participation in food waste recycling um, in the Commonwealth. And I can't stress that enough. We have almost doubled the amount of food waste that we're taking out of incineration and landfill by opening that, that depackaging facility. Um, as you heard from, from Kim, uh, there's only one mechanical separation facility in Vermont, um, that, that Chinook County Casella facility. Um, we commend Casella for actually taking the risk in building that facility um, because it has ensured that those tons do not leave the state and they end up uh, or end up in less desirable end sites. Um, we believe that for the benefit of the other parts of the state and for the benefit of consumer pricing, that more depackaging capacity and more collection points or, or organic transfer stations, if you will, need to be built throughout the state. Um, food waste is really unique um, in that the disposal pathway, how it's treated actually defines whether it's a destructive greenhouse gas or a fuel for renewable energy and regenerative agriculture. Um, we believe that Vermont has created the best example in the United States of how to do this. And I urge the state to continue um, encouraging the recycling of food waste and refrain from limiting the development of the necessary infrastructure that would ensure that food waste will remain in Vermont, and will be recycled in a carbon and a cost competitive fashion for the benefit of Vermont residents. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, any Clarifying questions for Mr. Hanselman. I do have one. You were talking about um, post-processing that allows uh, the additional reduction of uh, removal of phosphorus and 
plastic. So um, phosphorus of, is of course of interest. Um, can you just say something briefly about how much, uh, what you end up with, uh, I guess it, people are using the term contamination level, right? So uh, what percentage plastic remains in the, the ultimate product that leaves the facility to be used as fertilizer and if you yeah, might also is, quantify briefly the phosphorus reduction, it's of interest to everyone here as well. And the two are actually separate mechanical processes that we, we run at the farm. Um, so as, as we stated, we, we don't take materials that are more than 1% contaminated with, with plastics. Um, we then, after we've, we've actually um, taken that lower process, we run it through an additional screening system um, to reduce. So I I'm, couldn't tell you what our percentage is of, of plastics, but we're, we're actually taking a full secondary um, screening process to make sure that we're reducing as much as possible. Um, on the phosphorus is something that we're, we're extremely excited about, um, especially as someone who grew up swimming in Lake Champlain. Um, the phosphorus, as everyone knows, is an uh, issue in the watershed. Uh, we actually built a, I think it's first of its kind uh, on the East Coast, I think there's one in Indiana, um, a, a dissolved air flotation system where we actually remove the phosphorus um, from the uh, digestate. So food waste has an enormous uh, amount of, of phosphorus in it, uh, whether it's in compost or in, in anaerobic digestion. Uh, we've chosen to actually build the post-process uh, mechanical separation so that we can tune the phosphorus um, before the, the land application of the fertilizer. Um, I saw uh, Representative Smith and then Representative uh, Dolan. Uh, Dolan. Uh, thank you. My question was just answered. Thanks. Great. And, and I would uh, really um, echo um, Kim Crosby's <clears throat> invitation kind of as COVID um, hopefully diminishes, uh, we would very much like to host everyone at the farm um, to, to see the, the system in action. It, it's, it's quite exciting. Representative Dolan. Thank you. And I, uh, I too wanna thank you for your testimony and I appreciate uh, Chair Bray's last question. It's just a follow-up clarification. Uh, as you know, uh, Vermont has, been paying attention to plastic pollution with its initial ban of microbeads and now looking at my, microplastics in soils in conjunction with a healthy soils movement and regenerative agriculture for all the benefits we talked about for water quality, for food systems, for carbon storage, for uh, methane reduction, for our, uh, our, our food, in particular, our local food systems. And so the question with regards to plastics in digestates is of concern if we are then turning around and spreading that digestate onto ag soils as an amendment. So um, are you testing for, or is there a means to test or evaluate that digestate for the, the presence of plastics to ensure that we are, aren't uh, causing or contributing to accumulation of plastics on our agricultural soils? Yeah, unfortunately, I, I think I agree with Senator Campion and his statement earlier, which is um, whether you look at compost or, um, and, and I know we, we do quite a lot of work with CSWD um, in Williston and the other composters um, in the state, plastic is, is everywhere. Um, and whether it's, it's in the um, digestate or in the compost, um, it's an it's a challenge that we need to address um, at every stage. Um, so we, we are obviously working hard to diminish it. Um, I think there is got to be massive change in packaging legislation um, and in the um, looking really at the source material um, because it, it's, it's, this is not a unique issue to anaerobic digestion um, in composting, landfill, wherever um, you see food waste, there is significant amounts of plastic that is resonant in those streams. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we're working uh, diligently with all of the depackaging and, and at our own system to try and reduce it. Um, but it really is, is kind of a vertically integrated problem uh, where, where going back to the source is, is probably the most critical first step. 
um, and I'm hoping uh, some of the bright kids at, at UVM and MIT and all the other uh, institutions around the United States will actually come up with truly biodegradable packaging systems that allow us to remove those, those source contaminants. You're muted, Senator Bray. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Um, so I want to thank everyone. We have just two minutes left, so I think we'd wrap up. Um, I think one of the things that it's a long-standing interest of, uh, in this case, I think I can probably and Senator Senator Representative Sheldon will chip in here. But I think this is one where I think both committees think similarly uh, that. Um, contamination is an ever-going problem. And so we're trying to shift to a more precautionary approach to things as opposed to, so I, you know, entirely in agreement, going upstream, managing uh, packaging is ideal. But meanwhile, I think one of the most worrisome aspects is that if we uh, have a process that puts microplastics into organics, and then broadly applies those organics to the landscape, we risk um, soil as a living, healthy ecosystem by literally poisoning it. And, and so I think that's a, you know, an open, I, don't, I would say for myself, we don't know the answer, but we know there's a serious risk there. And we've been trying to make uh, progress and, and making some on things like PFAS, but, um, we keep seeing it's a pattern over and over again. Uh, dangerous chemicals get released into the environment, and then we are, it's virtually impossible to remove them. Um, so I think we're, we're trying to move ourselves to a, a more proactive, more precautionary footing where we don't once again allow something and then wonder how we will clean it up after we've proceeded too far down that path. Um, so uh, that's a little bit of editorializing, but it does, it is reflective of years of work in the committee, including making soil health part of the RAPs that didn't actually come out of the Ag Committees, came out of Natural Resources Committees. Um, so uh, with that, I'd love to turn to Representative Sheldon to um, see us off for the morning, if you have any concluding remarks. I think you summed up the challenge that's before us quite well. And I, I just really appreciate everyone taking the time to bring us this information. And um, we, we do need to follow up and figure out what our next steps will be. But um, I think that the issue of the soil contamination that's to the heart of it, and, and we gotta put our heads together and, and figure out how to prevent that um, from happening. Okay. Well, again, so thank you. Uh, to everyone who came in to help us learn some more today, fill us in on what's going on. Thank you to everyone on the two committees for getting together. We're just past 12. Um, so